Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Flex Alexander, and welcome to the Flex Zone All In Podcast. Uh, Buddy Lewis is out of town right now. He is held up in Costa Rica. They are uh, capturing silverbacks, and he's there right now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so uh, I'm in the building. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Canelia. I, I'm here, not silverback yeah, Jason. That's I don't a, know yeah, that right. Goodness. So that voice you hear saying, oh, my goodness, oh, my gosh. I'm so excited about this guest today because we go way back. I mean, we go back, back. Like, we were tied up and I farted on his back. And we'll explain oh, more of that later. Yes. But this brother Jeez. right here, we did the uh, well-received, most loved show on UPN called Homeboys in Outer Space. Uh, you've seen him in school days with Spike Lee and Giancarlo Esposito and Sam Jackson and all the guys, and most notably known, most popular, popularly known for his role as Ron Johnson on the hit show, A Different World. We have Mr. Daryl M. Bell in the building. What's up, y'all? How do? Yo. How you feel? <laughs> What's reunited going on? Reunited We are reunited. It feels so good. Maury? <laughs> oh, my God. Look, Ty. <laughs> Hit it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, but that, of course, uh, was our characters from uh, Homeboys in Outer Space, which, yes. listen, man, I have fun. I have, I've talked with Eric Van Lowe, the head writer for mm -hmm. Homeboys, who, who talks about how proud he is of that show. And what's, what's interesting, I tell folks, I, I have, you know, everyone doesn't have the privilege of having a career where, uh, you do something that is so revered mm -hmm. as a different world. So right. here we are 30 years later yeah. and, you know, we just did an event with the cast and we're still out as ambassadors for HBCUs yeah. and, and, and all of the legacy mm -hmm. that a different world has. So whenever they talk about the best television shows on in television history, a different world will usually find its way into yes. that conversation, even if it's vis-a-vis -vis Cosby, mm -hmm. Right. But inevitably, at least once or twice a year, somebody will put out the list of the top 100 worst television shows, and Homeboys in Outer Space is always on that list. Yes! As one of, so I'm at the top and the bottom of the best and the worst. And the, and the other thing that's interesting about it, though, is when you talk to people about Homeboys, and everyone talks about how much they hate it, but ask them to name the episode they watched. Mm -hmm. And most people don't know. They really right. hate it by reputation. Right. More so than having watched it and said, oh, this is so awful. Right. Because there were a few episodes that were actually really good. Yeah, we had some. And because and, 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 we, we might have listeners or viewers who this is beyond their generation, right? Uh, they yes. don't even know what this is. Yeah. What was the premise of Homeboys in Outer Space? Okay. And it came out around, what, 96, 97? If yeah, I'm not yeah it came out now. We shot 96, 96. Out, so yeah, yes. it came out 96. Break, 96. You, you want to break it down, D? Well, that's part of what the <laughs> issue was. So, so, you know, if you go back to Star Trek, one of the things that was so forward thinking about Star Trek w was its diversity. You know, you had all these different mm -hmm. species and people and so forth, and they were in positions of power. And Nichelle Nichols was, you know, uh, not only a black person in the future of some significance, but also you saw the first interracial kiss on television right. with her and William Shatner. So it was groundbreaking in that respect. So the idea originally for Homeboys was to be a parody of Star Trek. So much so that they even hired James Doohan, who played Scotty on Star yes. Trek, to be our <laughs> ship's engineer. Yeah. So when we were having problems, James Doohan would run out, Captain, I'm giving it all she's got. You yeah. know, and she's, he's giving us that, which was so cool. To the point where Paramount, and because UPN doesn't exist anymore, the United Paramount Network, they were a division of Paramount. Mm -hmm. Paramount sued its own subsidiary because it said that Homeboys was infringing on Star Trek IP. Hmm. Yeah. And that's why James Doohan had to get off the show. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because they said that we couldn't use that character because it was too close to what he was doing for real on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to do a parody of Star Trek. So, and and again, to portray black folks in the future in outer mm -hmm. space. Now, <laughs> what happened with that 
you know, it was a fledgling network. We were doing it and shooting it at Disney. So there was a, a, a battle between executives and writers of what it should be. And we did one episode, which actually was really funny. And I don't know if it was this one, but it was something that if, if it wasn't this specific episode, this is still the circumstance. We did this episode where we landed on this planet where they had lost all contact with the universe. Mm -hmm. They only got one signal. And that signal was from BET. All they got was BET. So when Ty and Morris showed up, they thought black people were gods because all <laughs> yeah. they could see was like the Jeffersons yeah, 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 and yeah. good times and black folks showed up. They were yeah. like, oh my God, yeah, you know, and yeah. they were bowing down to black folks. So some executive had the brilliant idea that that's the show. Every week they're going to land on a different planet where it's something happens. And then we went to the planet where everybody was naked. Then yeah. we went to the planet where it was this. Then we went yeah. to the planet and it was awful. Yeah. And it was so funny. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it was, it just got awful from yeah. that point on. <laughs> and uh, I had, I had two opinions uh, that I think encapsulated what was wrong with homeboys. One was very, now people may say it was controversial, but I got a call from Bill Cosby. Bill said, I don't think it, there's anything reprehensible about it, mm -hmm. but it just reminds me of bad Saturday morning cartoons. Hmm. And I was like, okay, that's probably right yeah. if you think about its sensibility. Yeah, yeah. But the really insightful one was when I bumped into this stand-up comedian who said, I loved that show and I was mm -hmm. sure I was being gassed until they rattled off multiple episodes. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you're not joking. And then said the issue or the problem you guys have is that you're trying to be too lighthearted and silly. Yeah. You should be biting like in living color. Mm -hmm. You should mm -hmm. be doing serious satire. Then it would be great, which what it, it was what it was supposed to be. Right. But also in America, Americans don't really get satire. That's why Benny Hill is not really popular here. Right. You know, uh, British yeah. folks yeah. get satire. Uh, yeah, yeah. We and don't really Bean get it. And all yeah, guys. you know, yeah, yeah. Americans aren't really into satire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this came from Roseanne Barr. Mm. Roseanne Barr wow. was a huge fan, and she said, "I can see that." I, yeah. I wish she said, "I really enjoyed you guys. You're doing a great job, uh, but I think you're missing the mark by really not being cutting edge, like in living color and pushing boundaries." And I was like, "That's what they wanted to do, yeah, but the network wouldn't let them do it." And then. Because we were only on for one season, there was a point at which they wanted to renew our show for like four years. Mm -hmm. They were just going to give us an automatic pick of four years. Yeah. And I can't remember what happened or why it, it didn't happen. But yeah, then UPN can. collapsed shortly yeah. thereafter I, because I our numbers were good enough. Yeah. And, 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 and mind you, I mean, we had one of the toughest critics uh, from the LA Times. I think it was Howard Rosenberg mm. at the time. And he hated everything. And he loved our show. That's and funny. Some say it was a kiss of death <laughs> because he doesn't like anything. But, you know, I, I go back and I say, man, I was 26, 27. Like, it, it was, it, you know, to be at that point, to be making the money I was making and to be working with, with D, which was, was great because obviously you come up watching a different world and you're like, yo, this is dope. We get to work together. Um we have fun, even yeah. in the bad stuff, even with the bad shit. We still have fun. I know I, I have fun. And there were times I looked and I just was like, <sighs> you know, like, man, mm, okay, let me just, let's just suck it up and go. And I would get calls back from New York. My mm -hmm. old manager, I remember I got in arguments, called me. He was like, yo, Flex, they clowning you here in the U.S. I was like, I don't care. Oh, whatever. I'm making 35K a week. <laughs> you know, you ain't give me that money. But I mean, I was... You know, and I, I got into this big argument one time with Ed Lover uh, when we were doing the, um, you know, when Come we on, the son. press. You know, we would do the press, yeah. and you have to make the calls in the morning yes. all across to the radio stations. And we literally got in an argument on on the phone. You know, he was it was Ed Lover, and Dr. Dre. And Dr. Dre is actually my cousin, and you know, he was stuck in the middle. I felt bad. You know, uh, uh, you know, he was with the come on. So he said, that's some trash. I was like, well, later for you, man. I said, well, who's the man was a bomb. Like, like oh, we was going. And who's oh, the man slander? Yeah, no, we were going back <laughs> and forth. We were going back and forth. On that's it. not And it was, good. it was, I mean, we, we're so past that now. But that's my dude. We're good. I mean, we were young and ego and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But 
um, it was it was a dichotomy of of the uh, response in our community. Yeah, you know, as opposed to like you know Roseanne. Yeah. You know, because our community was I mean, Spike Lee said we were the Amos and Andy of the nineties. Don't get me started. I was like Spike. Yeah. You know me. I've done stuff for you at your shop. I've done it. You've never hired me. You've never even I've never even auditioned for you. I said, so until you do something like that, you can't you don't put my name, don't say nothing. It it was just, and like you said, making remarks and not even watching the show. The effect was off the name. And I remember when I met with uh Eric Van Lowe because they tied me to the show because I had a deal with UPN. Mm. And um I had a deal with UPN. I remember Jennifer Part there. She's the one who gave me my, my my holding deal. And they sent me a bunch of scripts. This was actually the funniest script out of the bunch that I read. Mm-hmm. And being a Trekkie, I saw it. They was like, yeah, we got James Dewan. I was like, ah. And I didn't know the name. And then Eric was like, yeah. Because first, I didn't have, it was no title on it. And then Eric was like, yeah, we're going with Homeboys in Outer Space. And I was like, <laughs> No. The titles got a lot of people. I said, Joe, got a lot of people. E, no, don't know. He was like, no, it's going to be cool. I said, we're in 96. Homeboy, that's 80, you know, but he was he was bent on, on but, using but it. But I, I can't, but didn't Miguel Nunez and Have something to do with Miguel and uh, Miguel Stan. Nunez, Stan, uh, uh, what was Stan's last name? Oh, my gosh. And see, I, Foster. Stan Foster. Stan yeah, Foster. Because I, I started to say my other friend, Stan Washington. Yeah, Stan, Stan Foster. Foster. And then- I was told something like Eddie Murphy had something to do with it as well. I, I, I that can't, you know, Miguel said that, so I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but I know that he, he and Stan definitely were, yes, were were forefronts of, of pushing of, pushing that of, show. And you gotta, yeah. the thing about it is, black people historically, we've never been allowed to just have shows that may not be the best show on television, groundbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. White people get to have fun, quirky shows, stuff they just throw out there, yeah. stuff to pass the time, pr- um, procedurals, all mm-hmm. of these things. But for, for us, everything got to be Emmy nominated. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be groundbreaking. We don't have the opportunity to just throw up a show. And if it don't hit, it don't hit. Move on. No, it's it's true because I watched a show on HBO Max. I don't want to call it out, but um, this is a show. It's a quirky show on HBO Max. Um, and... I saw the preview and I was like, oh, this, okay, this looks like it might be a little something, a little country town in Kansas. And no one will figure it out now. Yeah. No, no one will. yeah. I'm not going to say the name. Yeah. It was a little country town in Kansas. <laughs> that, there was you the, go. that was the first setting. But um, I watched it and I was just like, it just had me waiting. I'm just like, ah, hmm. And then, you know, you see critics. So I'm like, oh, this is groundbreaking. This is great. The simplicity. And, and you're right because we, I, I, I can't name a show that we've had that really has been groundbreaking that's been simple that's been maybe it's about a guy who's a doctor who's a savant or whatever you know it's just something different i don't know if you can think of something like that well look my worldview has always been the reason i think african-american artists receive more criticism is because Partly by design and partly because it's self-inflicted, we don't have balance in the landscape of storytelling. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, I, I don't need to see any more slave shows. I'm just, I'm, I don't need, I just don't need it. We get the point. I saw Mandingo. I didn't need 12 years. I know Harry. I got it. Okay. I, you know, I got that message. I understand a new generation may need to learn it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I want to be done with slaves. Yeah. That's just where my head is at. Yeah. I understand that there were drug dealers who are now music execs. <laughs> yeah. Good God, I get it. I understand. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. So the point is, there needs to be some balance. Mm-hmm. And for white folks, they can have, you know, uh, uh, chariots of fire and porkies. Mm-hmm. But black folks really don't. We don't yeah. have that same, no. you know, breadth of yeah. diversity in storytelling. Right. And so often there are so many shows now where you look at it and I'm saying, if white folks produce this show, black folks would be up in arms protesting. Right. But because black folks are doing it to themselves, mm-hmm. you see these images that just, you know, codify the the the, the, the ills of our community mm-hmm. and... You know, that's why people get upset and they're like, well, can we do something else? But then 
if you go the other direction, you know, there are people who who will say, sorry, Vogue. No, that's all right. Um, there are, um, you know, when 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 a, a feel good story like or, or like or a film like Respect comes out about Aretha yeah. Franklin, nobody goes to see it. And, you know, so they're then like, they go, okay. yep, see? Yeah. yeah, they're like, we, we gave you something. It's a <laughs> yeah. biopic, you know, and every, everybody went to see Churchill, right? Right. Uh, everyone went, and, and the other side of Churchill was Dunkirk. Same Dunkirk. story right. told from different points right. of view. Right. Uh, and those stories were well done. So right. it's it's problematic in, in, in our community for those reasons that I, I, I think, I, I wish... There were more stories about, I mean, there are more black millionaires than ever. Yeah. There are more black billionaires than ever. Yeah. There is, you know, I I would say, you know, not that I, I, I haven't really seen a full episode of our kind of people. Mm -hmm. So that's trying to talk about right. affluent African-Americans, family, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. But it, it seems more soap opera-ish to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. uh, than does Succession. Right. Which is harder hitting, oh, and grittier, yeah. Yeah, darker, yeah. you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Love that show. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, I would love to see storytellers of color just start to tell stories that are a little different. And or is it the, the, the question of that we have the stories, we just not getting the green light? It's it's a combination. I, I think it's, it's a combination that you can... It, it's easier to sell the next drug dealer story mm -hmm. than it is to sell something else. Yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about that. Because you're looking that. at the train, you're looking at, okay, this has been successful. This is, hey, this is happening. This is happening. So it, it, they tend to jump on what is already yep. in motion. Nobody wants to take that chance. Yep. And then as soon as someone takes a chance, and then it's successful, everybody's like, hey guys, uh, let's, let's let's go over here. You know, this is this is what's popping now. Right. Well, look, look at Black Panther. Everyone mm -hmm. thought, you know, for decades. The reason why you can't have black people star in films is because they do horrible overseas. Mm -hmm. Around the world, yeah. they don't like Total black lie. stars. Like Eddie Murphy's movies weren't making billions of dollars. But mm -hmm. so here comes Black Panther. It's a mega hit. Now, granted, it was within the Marvel Universe, mm -hmm. which was already a juggernaut at the time mm -hmm. it was released. Uh, and as much as I love Black Panther... Within the Marvel series of the twenty-two films, Black Panther is not in my top ten. It, you know, wow. it, I, you know, of of the twenty-two. It's, wow. I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm gonna disagree. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, have to I, respectfully disagree. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, 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 you know, I'm. So I, all right. So we'll have to come back <laughs> to that. Mm -hmm. We'll have to come back to, mm -hmm. um, of why it it didn't rank as high, and there are reasons that, that that'll be an interesting story for yeah, us. Yes, I bet. Conversation, but the other thing is, everyone's like, "Oh, we finally got a black superhero." I'm like, "Stop, y'all!" Wesley Snipes was Blade a long time long before time that. Ago. Yeah, and Blade was really successful, mm -hmm. and it it proved that we could have done this a long time ago. Yeah. Now between Blade and Black Panther, you tell me we couldn't have had another black superhero before that? Oh, of course. Yeah, and yeah. and too that was before Marvel was the machine yes. that it was. Yeah. Cuz right. you know, we even Definitely. when Blade was out, I don't even think I realized. I was watching Blade just as Blade. I wasn't watching it like, "Oh, this is a Marvel comic Superhero, book character." Yeah. I had uh, no I didn't even connect it. Yeah, I just thought he world, was a standalone. Yeah. That's yeah. the world I came from. Yeah. Like the you know, the comic book. I loved comic books. So Seeing you know Blade and all these these uh, Marvel comic books come into life, I was ecstatic. I was like, "Oh my god!" When that Blade, I'm like, "What Blade? Oh my god!" That 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 to me is is when I think back when I was little and I would it, it, you know like Power Man and Iron Fist, um, mm -hmm. and then they did the Luke Cage series yep. and. Then they did the Iron Fist series, and which, which I still don't understand why Luke Cage was canceled because I really love that. Well, that, I, I think that's more of a Netflix. Netflix I, historically don't extend past a certain number of, ep of seasons, except like Ozark. Most Netflix shows get maybe three, four, and that's it. They don't. Well, do I long mean, runs. it didn't even get. I mean, Luke Cage wasn't even at. Was it like two? Two. Yeah, like I think so. You know, and and uh, I think there was Chio Hadari. Um, was it Chio Hadari Coker? It, yeah. Right? yeah, I think so. Uh, did a great job. Like, it, but I'm I'm saying in the space of the superhero. You know what yeah. I mean? For me, and that's one of the shows where everyone got their first taste of Mahershala Ali. 
you know, and and yeah, and and, and, and see, no, I was, for me, House of Cards. Yeah, it was House of Cards. House of Cards, but I yeah. mean, that's where they got he, their okay. Yeah, Remy, he Cards. was Remy Dent. Well, and wait, for me. and, and for, me, for me, mm-hmm. it was Predators, uh, yeah. the one with um, uh, what's my man who who kissed Halle Berry? I can't I can't say his name right now. Uh, oh gosh, when he won the Oscar, he he kissed. Halle oh oh, Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody. He mm-hmm. starred in Predators, plural. Oh, okay, and I think Robbie Rodriguez may have directed. Oh okay, um, and it had. Uh, uh, Mahersha Ali oh, okay. and that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I missed that one. Yeah. I missed yeah. that. But what I want to do is I want I, I definitely have to. We can't. We cannot have you here and not. I mean, just talk about the the iconic, just weight and and effect that Different World had on. Yes. Just it, it. You you guys really put forth a movement, of wanting you know black people to go to college, man. Yeah. Like for real, like what was first of all? What was the when you got the role? What was that process? In short, what was that process? Obviously, the audition process, but what was that when you get down to that final, those final choices? And what were your thoughts? And were you thinking like, if I hope, or you were just like, hey man, whatever happens, happens. So you 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 said in short because you know the, these casting stories are yes. always long. <laughs> yeah. So the short version is. I was auditioning. So we had finished school days and I came out to LA for the summer in May. Mm -hmm. By August, when classes were about to start again, that's when they started auditioning for a different world. They were going to do the spinoff. So I didn't have an agent. I, I, I had bumped into Spike on the street, asked him for a part in the movie. That's how I got school days. When I got to Los Angeles, Tyra Farrell introduced me to the Gage Group, and they decided to take me on as a client. By the time they took me on, I had gone out on maybe two auditions. Then they sent me on this audition for A Different World, and I went in with Eileen Knight. Mm-hmm. Now, when I auditioned for School Days, it was Robbie and Spike in a room about this big. Yeah, That's how I got the job. Uh-huh. Then I went to audition for Eileen Knight. And then... I called Kadeem because he and I are friends now. Mm-hmm. We're, we've gotten really close from school days. And I said, I'm auditioning for this spinoff of the Cosby show called A Different World. He said, yeah, I heard about it. You know, the um, oh, uh, not Ross, Barry Ross, but the casting folks in New York mm-hmm. knew Kadeem because he also had done an episode of Cosby and they were casting us there. He said, yeah, they called me in for it too. I was like, oh, great. Then I got a call back. So I called Kadeem. I said, I got a call back. He said, me too. And the next callback was with Eileen and like one other person. I said, now I'm getting, I'm going to network. He said, me too. They fly me, <laughs> they fly me to, to Los Angeles. Nice. So he flew in to LA. Yeah. So when it was time, and this was all for the role of Dwayne Wayne. Ah. So when it, when we got to network, it was myself, Kadeem. And I want to say, I think there was one other guy there. Uh-huh. So it was three of us. And they took Kadeem first. Now, everybody has their theory about how it goes. You take the first choice in or yeah. you take him last. With it. Yeah. And all I know, they was like, Kadeem. And they give him a pound. And, you know, all you, you could hear outside. Yeah. And there's a bunch of laughter. Uh, yeah, there, yeah. Right? So he comes out and he's like, hey, there. And then I walked in the room. I walked in. There were like 40 people in this room. Those mm-hmm. are, Yeah, that's how it used to yeah. be. Four, 40 people in the room and all of them like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make me laugh. Yeah. I had never seen anything like it. I froze. It was the Aww. worst audition of my life. Aww. Tank bomb. I was used to seeing two people. Yeah. Nobody yeah, told yeah. me what yeah. that was going to be. I had no clue, right. right? And I was completely blown away, intimidated by, intimidated by the whole situation. So I was awful. And so Kadeem ends up getting the job. I got to remember this short version. Mm-hmm. Now, Kadeem... Uh, is a classic New Yorker. Mm -hmm. He does not have a driver's license. So when he came out, now that he had to stay for real, Mm -hmm. he came to live with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving Kadeem to work to the job I didn't get every day. (laughs) (laughs) And Kadeem was so kind. We we just did a panel at Syracuse. It was Jasmine, Kadeem, myself, and Cree. Uh And when I told this story, I said, you know, I had to drive Kadeem to work every day to the job I didn't get. And he said, oh, yeah, you had to drive me home, too. Uh, <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. Uh, <laughs> come pick me up, too. <laughs> so I would come to work every day picking him up. But then by doing that every day, you know, um, it, it was such a, 
a family atmosphere. So, yeah. you know, got friendly with Marissa and Jasmine was yeah. already working on the show and Lisa and Lenny at the time because yeah. Lisa and Lenny were together. And um, Ellen Falcon was the director that oh, first yeah, season. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was just coming back and forth and we were hanging out. Mm -hmm. About midway through... Robbie Reed took over a casting from Eileen Knight. And Robbie called me and said, hey, there's this, this uh, uh, one line in the show this week. You want to do it? And I was like, okay. They're like, you, you're here all the right, time. You're anyway. already over here. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the card is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This way you can be here for real. So I was like, cool. So this, this was, uh, uh, the line was, it, there was a party scene my character walks up to Whitley and says, I knew it could be done. That's it. And then walk away. So that line came up on tape night, on rehearsal night. Mm -hmm. And the actual performance went something like, I knew <laughs> it <laughs> could <laughs> be done. I mean, I, I stretched it out for like 20 minutes trying to get all the screen time I can get. And then, you know, we were finished, yeah. right? So then I knew I was done. So I only had one other scene, which was the last scene in the show. So I go back upstairs to the dress room and I change into my other outfit. Mm -hmm. And I'm chilling. Daryl! Like, what? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm ready for the last scene. We have to do it again. Oh. <laughs> you didn't know about that. I didn't know. I didn't know. I get, I gotta, and I gotta change clothes now. Yeah, it takes yeah, all the time. Yeah. I'm all the way upstairs. When I come back downstairs, all the execs and everybody looking like, oh, I'm like I'm you know, it is, yeah, I'm yeah. costing them money, the audience, and all this. Yeah. And the funny thing is, they found out I wasn't there. They started the scene, and Jasmine turned, and there was nobody there to oh, say that. Oh, no. <laughs> That's how they oh, found out gosh. that I wasn't there. That so hilarious. So I think I've ruined my reputation now on yeah. the set, right? So it was a couple weeks later <laughs> where Keisha Knight Pulliam was coming to play Rudy, who was coming to visit Denise, and she falls in love with Whitley. But Keisha was a minor, so she couldn't work. So Robbie called me again. Said, look, Daryl, this isn't a role, but I want you to be a stand-in for Keisha because she, you know, she can't work. She has to be at school. Right. Um, but, you know, for camera, we're going to need you to be her size. So they got me like hockey uh, pads to be on my knees uh -huh. so I could be, you know, an right, eight-year-old right, right. girl. And I had to go because she was trying to do a southern accent <laughs> like uh, a little girl. You know, so I had to do that all week. And everybody just thought it was the funniest thing. Uh, so they hated me a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Suddenly now I was really cute and I was funny and they liked it. And that entire week, Rudy had to get in bed with Denise. And she had to get in bed with Whitley or something like that. So uh, I had to curl up in bed with Lisa Bonet. Uh, and then I had to get in bed with Jasmine. Right, so right. it was a, it was a brutal week for me. Yeah, just yeah. brutal. brutal. Awful. That sounds awful. And then it was uh, a couple, you know, like, there were a couple one-liners after that. Mm -hmm. Then there was the episode where Dwayne was going to be dating an older, an upperclassman. Uh -huh. And they wanted somebody to play his best friend. That's when they called me in. But they said this was going to be a recurring role. And Tom and Marcy said they wanted to open it up to casting. Right. Now. I told you this is a long, long story. No, no, tell yeah, it. So, we love it. So, tell so, it. Tell it. So when Kadeem and I were in Atlanta shooting school days, we would go to Six Flags and we would record Run DMC songs because they used to have a little recording booth. You could do uh -huh. karaoke and record yeah, yeah. a song. So I'm Daryl. He was Joe. And I bought myself this little hat to look like the hat that Run DMC used to mm -hmm. wear. Then... Um, during that summer, I got, uh, uh, or, or right before the summer, in school days, if you notice, I played Big Brother X-Ray Vision. I had these mirrored sunglasses. Yeah. Well, those glasses were the Malcolm X black rim frames, mm -hmm. but they were just clear. So instead of the black with the wire, right. they were white clear right. with the wire. And then I put mirrored lenses in them. So I had to get regular glasses, so I just took the tint out of those glasses, and those were the glasses that I wore. Mm -hmm. And then after that, 
um, uh, my uncle, my great uncle, who was a jazz musician, saw me wearing the hat. He said, you know, son, that's a cheap hat. You need to get yourself a pork pie. A pork, a Stetson pork pie. That's that son. That's what all the do. All the cats used to wear. The ladies mm-hmm. love. So I got the Stetson pork pie. So now I got glasses. I got the pork pie. I got my little mustache. And they tell me we got to audition for it. They put in the breakdown. Ron. That was just the character's name. Hat, glasses, mustache. I was like, oh no. <laughs> Everything that I've created that's all mine yeah. is in the breakdown. And when I tell you, everybody, Stoney Jackson, Jerome, like oh, everybody in their imagine. mother, where well, they opened it up because now the show's been on the air right. for a few weeks and it's a mega hit, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody came for this audition. And wow. so finally, uh, when it was my turn to come in, it was Ellen Falcon. Robbie Reed, Marcy Carcy, and Kadeem was in there for Reed. So I walked in the room and they're like, what's up? I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and yeah. so we had instant chemistry. We 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 crushed the audition. I'm like, all right, well, I'll be out in the car when you're done so we can go home. I'm trying to eat, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're like, what do you mean? And like, I don't think Marcy knew at the time. It's like, well, that's his best friend and he lives at his house. <laughs> Everybody could go home now. So that's wow. how I got that role. And um, then they put me on like just a weekly player every week. I, I signed a one week contract for like the rest of the season. Mm. Wow. And once the season was over and it was announced that Debbie Allen was coming on for the second season, mm-hmm. Debbie and Beth Ann, Kadeem's mother, mm-hmm. friends, and Debbie called Beth Ann and said she wanted to meet Kadeem and come out to the house. And Kadeem said, Can I bring Daryl? She's like, Sure. Okay, honey, bring him too, yeah, yeah. right? Uh-huh. We we were having dinner. The Debbie cooked for us in her kitchen, and she she was talking to us about what she wanted, you know, for us for the second season. I said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm only a weekly player." That she said, "You're not under contract." I said, "No." She said, "Honey, we are gonna fix that. Wow. <laughs> You're not going anywhere." Wow. And that's how I became a season regular, wow. starting in season two. Now, when you met with Debbie, once that first season, because if you know, if you're a fan of the show, you yeah. know, season one is totally different from yeah. the rest of the series. Yeah. yeah. At that meeting with Debbie, did you know the tide was going to change a little oh, yeah. bit? You could kind of feel that. Oh, it, it was it was definitive. Part of you know, here's here's there are there are two worldviews. So Ann Beats, who was the producer who passed away, I think last year. Uh, Ann Beats was a producer and writer on Saturday Night Live and she produced this other show called Square Pegs. Ann Beats was brought in to produce this show. And w- while everyone talks about how much they didn't like the first season, we were the only the second show in television history to debut and end the season at number two. Mm. The only other show was Bewitched. Mm. Ann Beats was like, all I did was give Carsey Warner and NBC a mega hit. It's the number two show on television, and I got fired for it. Mm. Wow. So that's her world. And it's true. The numbers were staggering, yeah. right, every week. But it was, Ann Beat's worldview was, this is just about guys wanting girls and girls. And it was very similar to Square Pegs. It was very high schoolish. I mean, right. look. Lisa Bonet is one of the most beautiful women in the world. And we put a pig nose on her face. Like, what are we doing yeah. Yeah. in college? Yeah. You know, they're like, this is this is not right. right. So that's when they reached out to Debbie. Even before we came back that summer, all of the writers went to Howard's homecoming. Debbie was like, come, we're going to an HBCU. Y'all going to come with me to Howard, to my school, yeah. Bison's, right on. <laughs> and y'all going to see what, what HBCU life is really like. This is what we're going to portray. Right. And that was when it, it was, we're going to make it real. Wow. And part of the reason Marissa didn't come back in the second season was Debbie said, look, there are white students that go to HBCUs, but we need to address it. And I don't think the network nor Carsey Warner wanted to have that frank conversation. Mm. And so they didn't. And that's that's kind of where that, Changed. I, th- I think I think her career turned out okay. <laughs> you know, my I've, cousin Benny, I've, Marissa's history. I've told this story a million times. It's not new. When we found out Marissa wasn't coming back, we were 
we were at somebody's house. We were at this party and there were a bunch of tears and crying and hugging. And Kadeem said, don't worry, Marissa, you're white. You're going to win an Oscar. Boom. What? Facts. Win an Oscar. Won, won an Oscar. What? I told her that that night. And, you know, <laughs> Marissa is super talented. Uh, yeah. An incredible and wonderful, wonderful woman and human being who I miss terribly. I have not seen her in years, but wow. it's like, you know, um, I know she she and Lisa and I think even Cree see each other more often. I I, I don't know if Kadeem saw somebody and, right. and somebody else just posted on social media. Yes, yeah. Aunt May was on a different world. Yeah, that, wow. that's that's real talk. That is crazy. She's, she's done great. Now, she's so happy. There, there, you know, the, I saw Kadeem. I one of the one of the I don't know what it was on. But they were doing the whole thing. It was Kadeem Cree. They were talking. I didn't know they dated. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, that's crazy. And then she's like, "Yeah, look at the scene where I kiss him." And da da da. And they zoom. They go. And it was like some old, <laughs> like in the middle. <laughs> I was like, that was, and, and and you wonder how does that work? You know, two young people. And let me tell you something. When I used to come up to the different world set, I, I was like, yeah, it, it's popping up here. Yeah. Like it was one of the best, liveliest sets with all the late. I mean, it was, it was crazy. You had them dating. You had Gary Durdan, who was an extra. I didn't see. I don't know if Gary was ever. He he was an extra. I it, he, I saw him with no lines. I seen him in background scenes several times. I now see that 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 may be something I have to find. Yeah. When, when Gary came on to Shaza and uh -huh. was crushing Shaza before I think before he started speaking. Let me say that maybe mm -hmm. kind of the same trajectory you took before he started speaking. I saw him in a few episodes where he didn't have any lines. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna check that because yeah, look, yeah. you can always learn something new. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh and and once again, even we learn new things whenever we get together and start telling right. stories. So when when Cree talked about her audition process mm -hmm. and she said she had just gotten to LA from Canada. She hadn't been there that long. Mm -hmm. And I I I tell everyone, uh when when Cree got the job Said, so, you know that that cartoon you see with the bulldog and he's walking around and the other dog, hey Spike, how you doing? Yeah. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. She come to work every day. Oh my gosh, we're so happy. You guys know this show is so good. I've been watching this show. This is so wonderful, man. I can't believe I'm here. I was in Canada, but now I'm in Los Angeles. And look, I'm on the show and I'm with you guys. I used to watch you every day. I was like, oh my gosh, where did this girl come from? Uh, she was just so excited and happy, and and it it was it's sweet and all that. But when she talked about she came to audition and she said so she and one the weirdest thing that we didn't know she was auditioning against like the other girl for the role and they asked her would you mind if she spent the night with you to come back for network tomorrow and she said okay she took some stranger and let her spend the night at her house. What? I so, can see how that happens. I just don't want to tell the higher ups no. You put on the spot. You like if that if I say no, they're gonna think bad of me. You young, you're an actress. You don't know no better. That's a tough spot to be in. Unbelievable. This was back then. Wasn't no rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wasn't no rules right. back then. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a tough spot. We were blown away, blown wow. away. And you know, there's always some little competitive kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she said she came in the next day when it was time to audition. And Kadeem walked in the door and she said, she just saw him and said, I'm going to get this job and that man. <laughs> yes, yes. I see and got both. That. Yes. And did both. Yes, that was her motivation. Wow. She's like, I'm going to get that and him. That and that's is crazy, that, that, man. And here's, here's the even, so Kadeem and Cree are actually dating. Cree and Jasmine are, are really close, but Jasmine's real boyfriend was the character Julian Dominic Hoffman, who was on the show. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so, Kadeem is in playing love interest with Jasmine, who's Cree's best friend. So they're kissing each other today. We're all friends with with Dominic, who was also in School Days, and Kadeem is kissing his girlfriend every day. Then when Ron breaks up with Kim. 
Ron starts dating Cree, so now I'm kissing my best friend's girlfriend every day. I mean, you know, it's just like all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes, it's just like, wow. Somebody somebody wrote in, you know, I like the different world, but then it got all incestual. Well, we didn't know from watching at the house. At the house, we were like, yeah, it's getting good. Yeah. We didn't know right. no that, better. Yeah. That's we what, just, that's it was, what it was just all like. good. That's yeah. what it was like in school. I know, you know yeah. what I mean? Everybody, yeah. you know, one day, this was talking to this one, this talking, and we just kept it moving. I was like, well, you can't have a relationship with someone who's not on camera. That yeah, doesn't work. Right. So you, can only, you can only date the folks who are here. So that's yeah, the way yeah. it works. So, and, yeah. The it, it, you know in in those stories, man, like especially in the, in the casting process, and I go back to Homeboys in Outer Space um, because I remember getting a call from from D Bell, and I don't know if you knew the other other side or you because uh, I don't know if you knew about did you know about Mel Jackson? Yeah, I did. Okay, so Mel Jackson, who was in Soul Food, who played uh, uh, the one who got Makai the job and was talking about uh, the Coke bottle. Yeah, he was the original uh, Morris. Morris oh. in Homeboys. So, um, and I, I only bring that up because I, I remember you saying, you know, you driving, you know, Kadeem back and forth to work. That I, that's what I did for Mel as we were doing the party because he's here from Chicago. Yeah. Didn't know anybody. It was taking to the barbershop, all that, boom, boom, boom. And this was my first introduction to how cold the game is, you know, before I had it done to me later. <laughs> uh, right. But, you know, we do the pilot, all that, and they're going to pick it up. And then I just get a call from this dude. He's like, Hey, hey, what's up, man? I'm like, well, yeah, we're gonna do this thing. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what, what, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Morris. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm on the show. I was like, it, it, I never, I hadn't experienced that. I didn't know, and, and, and I never heard. And right after that, nobody explained anything to me. I didn't hear from mm-hmm. Mel anymore. It was, and he and I didn't talk. We just start, talk, spoke recently uh, because I was, I was a little hurt. I was like, you know, hey, man, I was there for you. You know what I mean? And he had success and, and went on with soul food and some other things and, and. Um, you know, I was like, man, I was like, bro, I was, I was there for you. But a lot of people don't know how those stories go. I tell my story about Blue Bloods all the time, you know, doing the pilot. They're like, yeah, man, pick your apartment, da 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 da. And then not, nah, you know. <laughs> well, funny you mentioned it because Mel and I talked because I, I remember Mel said he wanted to watch it because he, he said to me, and I'm from Chicago and Mel right. knows some of my family. Ah, and all that. okay, okay. So, um, Mel said, I remember him telling me he wanted to watch because he wanted to see in my performance what they were looking for that he wasn't doing. I said, I I don't know that you'll ever get that. You'll never know because that's the way things were. It might have been you were just one inch too tall. You know, you'll never know what it is. And new. This was, he was very new. Yeah. Yeah, he was very new. You never can know. But I, I can, I can, I'll share the flip side of that going the other direction. Mm -hmm. Um, When they were casting for, uh, Denise on the Cosby show. Mm-hmm. It was between Lisa Bonet and this other actress. And back then, right before you would go to network, you got the contract and it's for a five-year contract. Yeah. And this actress looked at the contract so it was five years and said, well, I, I can't do this. And they said, what do you mean? He said, I, I, I'm, I'm not signing a contract for five years. He's like, this is Bill Cosby. Man, this is yeah. all this. She was like, no, nah, I'm going to be a singer. It was like, all right, do you uh, have a record think, deal? Yeah. No. Well, who tells you you can sing? My mother. Where do you sing? At church? Whitney Houston. Yeah, it was Whitney. Whitney, look, look Whitney, like, listen, <laughs> check me in a couple years, wow. okay? Same Saving all my love for you. Same story with Maggie Marissa Tomei. It was her and this other actress. Mm-hmm. Got that five year contract, said, can't do it. Why not? I got a role in this movie. I said, well, yeah, but this is a spinoff of the Cosby Show. This is gonna be amazing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I got cast in this movie. I gotta go do this movie. Well, are you the star of the movie? No. Are you the co-star? No. She wouldn't do it. Meg Ryan, the movie was Top Gun. Wow. And she went to do that instead. Yeah. Sometimes look, look, sometimes and and maybe, you know, some people just have that intuition and sometimes people have a, a team behind them who are kind of telling them, yeah. no, 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 you need to this is the mm-hmm. move. Sometimes you just luck in, sometimes you just luck out. And I think and, and, and also um it's weird because when people have that no fear attitude like, you know, whatever, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm passing it. it it always seems to work out. If you don't do it for money, if you do it for the right reasons, then right. generally that works out. I, you know, um, uh, there was there was an actor who was offered the role of 
um, oh gosh, I'm going to say it wrong, uh, uh, from Lord of the Rings, uh, Ian McKellen mm -hmm. played him. Uh, what was the character's name? Gandalf. Gandalf, thank you. And they wanted this actor to, to play it, and he said no. And then they said, please, you know, we'll, we'll up your fee. And no. And he kept saying no. So finally they offered him some percentage of the gross oh. of the movies to do it. He still said no. And it went to Ian McKellen, uh, and the actor was Sean Connery. Hmm. Wow. It, it, you know, it, it's hundreds of millions of dollars that he turned down. And and he was probably cool with it because it, it was the life he wanted to live, yeah. you know. And this yeah. was in the twilight of his life when he was not working that often, and he he didn't want to do it. Right. And there was no amount of money they could pay him. And plus, at the time, I don't think he thought Lord of the Rings was going to be right. Lord of the Rings. You have like, what is this Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Lord do you think of doing the this makes me feel better or worse? <laughs> So, so when you think about episodes of a, yeah. a different world, world, the legacy, what yeah. were some of the of those episodes that you feel like really like stuck with you, right? Yeah. And there's so many, but yeah. if you could just name like a few, which one was which ones would those be? Uh, of the, of of my favorites, certainly all of the episodes where we had either Patty the Bell or Diane Carroll uh, favorites, yeah. uh, and those were always master class weeks. So, you know, for me, having, you know, I didn't study acting classically. I didn't. So for me, I, I, I was, you know, for whatever talent I have to perform, you know, uh, uh, my training, mm -hmm. I watched everybody else. So when you have Glenn Turman, Mary Alice, oh, yeah. Lou Myers, and, and particularly Lou, Lou is a stage guy. And if you watch Mr. Gaines in all those scenes, yeah. lots of actors, you know, look at, at scripts and go, bullshit, 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 my part. Bullshit, <laughs> yeah, bullshit, yeah. bullshit, but my part. Yeah, yeah. M Lou Myers was back there giving Mr. Gaines life in every scene he was in. He was yeah. watching you. He was doing something. He was, he was busy yeah. all the time. Um, so just having... Ron O'Neill and Richard Roundtree and Harold Sylvester and yeah. all of these folks were out. Amazing. Uh, so those were always big time events. Patty would cook for us and, you know, it was uh, yeah. spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I, I talked recently about the episode when Lena Horne was there. Mm. And, you know, these are the occasions when you meet words that are overused like legend and icon. Yeah. And when she exceeds every expectation of who you want her to be, and she's more than that. Mm -hmm. And it was the experience where, you know, anybody might come to our set on any given day. Mike Tyson would come by, Denzel came by, Wesley Snipes came mm -hmm. by. The week Lena was there, all of a sudden I turn around and here comes Ossie Davis. Wow. Then here comes Burt Reynolds. Then here, then Roseanne and Tom Arnold, like, what, what's going on? Like, we just heard Lena Horne was here mm. and we're coming to pay respect. Uh. Oh, wow. Like, folks from on, they heard on the lot, they left what they were doing to come and bow down uh. to Lena Horne. Then you can take any of the other episodes with all the other music guests, whether it's In Vogue or yeah, yeah. Uh, Gladys Knight or Criss Cross, mm -hmm. Heavy D, you know, yeah. Tupac when yeah, he was on. Yeah, yeah. Piccolo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, our show was a perennial top five. And, you know, uh, like I said, we finished number two behind Cosby uh, until our fifth season. We finished number four ahead of Cosby. Mm -hmm. But we were the number one show on television one week that I know for sure. And that was the episode where Blair Underwood came to guest star as a uh, young army serviceman who was about to go off to the Iraq mm. war. And it was a brilliant episode. It was very dramatic. And our episode aired on a Thursday when Bush number one, George H. Bush mm. had given Saddam Hussein a midnight deadline to comply with the U.S. demands or there would be serious consequences. Mm -hmm. A Different World aired that night, 8 p.m., excuse me, Eastern, was the number one show on television, and we started bombing Iraq that night. Mm -hmm. That episode was written by Dominic Hoffman and Jasmine Guy. Wow. 
Um, then you can take the wedding episode, which is iconic television. Oh, yeah. You know, everyone in that breakup. Yeah, and, and yeah. One, you know, just a quick tidbit on that. One, Kadeem hated that episode. Really? Hated what? it. Why? And, and here's, a, he, he'll tell you that he just didn't like, he said, as a man, I'm not going to go break up some man's wedding. I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. This is. I would go to her the night before. Right. And in watching it, there's this really compelling scene where Dwayne goes to see Whitley the yeah. night before. And Debbie just watched, because we just watched it. Debbie shot it like film. It's beautiful. It's not mm -hmm. typical for camera yeah. angles. It, it's, it's very much a film angle. And... um. So he got the scene he wanted, but Debbie's like, honey, we're going to do this wedding. And, you know, this, this is about to happen. Uh, and, and, you know, and so it was against everything he wanted. So he's just mad and he's pouting the whole time. So when it came time to do it, he was so just in his feelings about it, he right. forgot his lines. Uh, so when you see him go, honey, will you take me to whatever? Baby, please. Right? Yeah. He he was yelling to please because he couldn't remember what he wanted to say and he knew that wasn't the cue. And he was like, Jasmine's not gonna say her line until she gets the cue. So I just need to tell her, please yeah. say something, because I don't want to do this again. Yeah. Let's get it over with. And yeah. that was what was driving him. And that's the take they kept. Wow. It was not what was written. Now, all of that was improvised. And How many takes did they do of that scene? One. Just one? That's it. That's, that's it. the one. They didn't do it again. They're like, wow. we got it. Because, you know, and I mean, it was a big set. It was yeah, everybody yeah. was I there. That. And it just, whack. That's the one they kept. I remember that, man. What, now, at what point do you think actors, you know, you, you do a series like that and obviously like Kadeem, who, who's directed, uh, Lisa Bonet, at what point do you think you go from, you know, I am an actor, cast member, you know, second, third season to then that different mindset to where, like you said, a Kadeem is like, you know, grappling with, with a scene because it's not something that's natural to him. Oh, we, we, you know, we were empowered the moment Debbie Allen stepped on stage. Wow. So, there, there is, and oftentimes there's a Chinese wall between the writers and the performers. Mm -hmm. Debbie was like, we're not going to have that. At the end of every run through, every day, the writers would come down to the stage and then they would sit and talk with us. And we'd have a note session with them. Mm -hmm. We'd tell them what we thought. They'd tell us what they thought. Mm -hmm. And then they would go back and write. we get it in the morning. Mm -hmm. But we talked to them every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that kind of empowered us. Plus... We had multiple times, probably in about a th third, fourth season, somewhere around there, where we all wrote suggestions of storylines we liked. And some of them made, made it, it, right? Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I want to say I, I did, I, I think my storyline was uh, Lou Meyer, uh, not, but Mr. Gaines found himself in financial trouble. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Colonel Taylor was being used for a an all white golf course where they were going to make him a member just so they could have their quota mm -hmm, and that storyline made yeah. it uh the fact that Ron had a crush on Whitley that that made oh, it you know i, I can yeah, all these all these made it in and by the way I'm, I, just this other going backwards for one second uh -huh. the same week of the wedding show for Jasmine she said people kept coming up to all week. Isn't this exciting? You're getting married. You're putting a dress on. You're doing it. And Jazz was like, y'all know this ain't real, right? I ain't really marrying this man right here. She's like, this is, you know, and she said it was just so annoying because in real life, she and Dominic were breaking up. Oh, uh, mm. poor Jasmine. So, so she's uh, dealing with yeah. both emotions at yeah, the same time. Yeah. Yeah, she she breaking up with one guy, marrying yeah, the guy she yeah. loved, but breaking up with the guy she really loved. So there were all these yeah. things going around. And it's just how those, you know, I, I tell folks, just like, you know, Jaws became the movie it is because the shark didn't work. Right. <laughs> this became the scene it was because they didn't listen to what they wanted yeah. and they got what they needed. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, there you go. So there's so, that. Oh, and I, I'll give you the last mm -hmm. uh, uh, episode, my favorite, which is mine and Kadeem's favorite, Cats in the Cradle, when Ron and Dwayne go to the football game and get into a 
racial fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's told Rashman style, our version, their version. Yeah. And then, you know, what the truth is. And that was with Dean Kane. Yeah. Uh, and it was it was Dean's first job on television. Wow. You there get, was there was so many from the Wayans brothers to yeah. Blair Underwood to uh, uh, Halle Berry to uh, uh, David Allen Greer. Like everybody was on us. Candy Alexander was on our yeah. show. Um, Candy's amazing. I, I, yeah. I, her work is just she goes unnoticed, man. She is she is a powerhouse. Roscoe Lee Brown, Roger Guinevere Smith, Eric LaSalle, Whoopi Goldberg, the AIDS episode. Tisha Campbell oh, was on. I mean, gosh. everybody to guest spots on our show. So it was magnificent in that way. Now going, now yep. obviously coming through with the powerhouse uh, like like Cosby, I just want to tap on this for a minute, not go deep, but um, yeah, you because know, you have to, I mean, you know, we yep. have the, the Kamal Bell special obviously, but I want to, my thing, what I want to focus on is coming through with a powerhouse like that, right? You have the spinoff, you come in with this backing and Everything that's happened, obviously. The question, one of the questions they asked on that special, we need to talk about Bill Cosby, was one, because I look at the other side with things that have happened, you know, other communities, and I say, can it be separated? The art from the man? The art from the man. So. And that's the only place I go. I'm not going any deeper. Just this, that. I just want to know. So, full disclosure, uh, Bill Cosby and I were producing partners for several years. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I have n- no news to break because I have no knowledge right. of any of the, the accusations. Yeah. All of that was right. for my time. Uh, that said, um, the idea of separating the art from the artist, I, and, and let me acknowledge my own hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. So, I was given that lesson while shooting school days. One of the, the the best memories I have of school days was all the time I spent with Branford Marsalis. Oh, yeah. And I remember, I, I can't remember who it was, but somebody famous did something. I was like, oh, I can't pay attention to what they did. He said, why not? He said, some of my greatest inspirations musically are complete asshole <laughs> they're drug addicts yeah. they're, they're all, but they were brilliant musicians yeah i learned from their music I, I didn't need to be their best friend i didn't need to be you know um you know their priest or anybody else that i was only interested in the music they made right and that changed my my worldview forever after that so right. my ability to bifurcate the art and the artist was pretty easy now that the everybody I believe needs to acknowledge their own hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. My own hypocrisy came with uh, John Mayer mm-hmm. when he did the Rolling Stones, I think, article, and he said Jessica Simpson was like sexual dynamite or something like that, mm-hmm. and 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 then he talked about how. He could never sleep with a black chick because he had a KKK dick. I was like, okay, I, <laughs> right? If you if you have not heard, <laughs> like no no joke, yeah. I heard it. I literally wiped every John Mayer song from my iPod, and I have not looked at that cat or his music since. I right. you know because that just it just I thought what he did in outing, however. You know, he enjoyed his private relationship. Sorry, I'm a little... No. Uh, a little, little juicy. <laughs> his, 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 his private, and then, you know, all the way... His private relationship with Jessica Simpson, I just thought, what kind of jerk does that to a woman? It's just, it was really yeah. not cool. And then to, to double down with the KKK dick on, yeah. I, I could never sleep with a black woman? Okay, yeah. he was done. Now, at the same token... You're not gonna stop me from listening to Michael Jackson's music. No, you just never. you're not. Yeah. It it you know it's it's a soundtrack to my life. It does every time I hear Mike's music, I don't think of what he was accused of. Right. Um, and so, irrespective of whether you believe Michael to be innocent or not, that is easier for me. Uh, again, 
I didn't have the same reaction to Michael that I did with John Mayer. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I credit, you know, D.L. Hughley, who said, you know, Bill Cosby may be guilty of many things. Cliff Huxtable is guilty of nothing. Mm. And I think it's been unfortunate that to the extent, you know, immediately after when Cosby was taken off TV land and so forth, yeah. you know, every other artist who worked on that show you know, all of them were impacted by that. Yeah. All of their residuals, everything else, all of their work, yeah. you know, has now been condemned and, and you know, deemed to be less than, yeah. which I think is really unfair and, and uh, unfortunate. So, yeah. and, you know, I, I suppose there are some people who may feel the same way, but I think certainly to a lesser degree about Woody Allen, yeah. certainly to a lesser degree about Roman Polanski, yeah. certainly to, you know, so look, I don't know if, if uh, somewhere I think Charles Manson was making paintings. I yeah. wouldn't buy a Charles Manson <laughs> painting. You know, I'm like, I'm not interested in that. Yeah, well, okay. I don't think no, that, and, and, and we can dismiss that just on the artistic value. Yeah. I don't know if the painting was that good, right? And I, I'm not trying to go find a way to, yeah. to look at that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that's that's just, in, in my sensibility, um, I don't believe in revisionist history. Mm -hmm. So everyone who wants to ignore all of the impact that Bill Cosby had on people going to school mm -hmm. and the people, and when I say going to school, I don't just mean who were inspired. I yeah. mean, those he actually paid for them to go to school yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, you know, I, I don't know if Spellman gave the twenty million dollars back. Right. I don't know if all the other schools who got money gave the money back. Right. I don't know if all of the lives that were changed because, irrespective of what he may or may not have been doing in his private life, they saw Cliff and Claire Huxtable and said, "I can be a doctor and I can be a lawyer," right. and and did that right. and changed their lives. We hear that from people all the time yeah. who come up and talk about a different world. Yeah. Um, I I know that you know I haven't seen. The, the Kamu Bell special. Yeah. I, I'm in the list where <laughs> I understand where they said this long list of folks they asked to be in it who said no. Yeah. And I was a no. Yeah. But it actually, it actually, you know, because I was a little, you know, pensive about watching it. I was like, uh, it's, you know, what? But it, it actually, you know, it was, I think it was well rounded on both ends. Yeah, and, I agree. And in no way do we take light of, you know, anything, you know, happening to women as anything yeah. like at all. Um, but I was just curious about the other side of it because, you, you, you know, now with Joe Rogan, what's going on with him first, it was, oh, he's giving misinformation about COVID. Then it was, you know, the, the you know, the, the end bombs um, where he was just explaining, telling stories about Red Fox or, and they just took a compilation and put them together and he's talking about, Richard Pryor's album was called Bicentennial Nigga and and he was just and they just took him and put him together but and I was like okay maybe but then when it got to hey I went into the movie theater and it was Planet of the Apes it was like Africa there was not a white person in there that's when I was like mm. and and I got there way before that I mean listen I'm of the school of as people you know what the N word means to black people yeah. you know that it has an effect on the majority or at least some black people if you are a yeah. person of white descent and you are saying it <laughs> yeah. so if you consciously say something that you know is hurtful or harmful for other people to hear and you still do that mm -hmm. then there's some accountability or you sitting in that space where you just don't care right. so whether you you can racist not nah, whatever the the title is but you you are aware of your your harm yeah. your harm doing right. but i it, but i agree and, and and i think all of this shows us that two things can be true at the same time oh, yeah. right the, you can have a, a, a you can create wonderful content groundbreaking um um you know shows and and movies and you can put people in school and you can also have done these things over right. here it yeah. can be true at the same time yeah. um and you know I think as individuals, people just got to decide what that means to them right. and how they carry it, you know? Yeah. I, the, the, I, I, got, I give Joe a lot of credit for the one comment he made that just, 
it hit home to me that it's better than I've heard anybody who's ever been in any controversy. Right. So in addition to, you know, using the word as many times as he did, mm. and I, I, I forget the first time I heard somebody say when when a white person asked, well, why can't I say it? And the retort was, why do you want to? Why do you want <laughs> to say it? Yeah, you know, well, why is it that you so, yeah. I don't find myself, and I, I've told people, I can't count on two hands. How many times I've been in the company of someone white who's dropped the word and then was like, oh, Daryl, I'm so sorry. Right. Like never in my life have I used a Jewish slur, yeah. white slur, yeah. you know, Italian. I've used yeah. no racial slur ever. Right. And has it, oh, I'm so sorry. Right. Never happened. Yeah. Right. So the, the idea of why you want to use it is first. But Joe, when talking about the Planet of the Apes yeah. comment. He said, look, I did not mean that black people were apes. And I didn't mean that the the Africa connection. But I clearly understand if you listen to it, that's the inference you could get. So let me say this. I am not a racist. But anybody who has to make that statement, you fucked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, he was yeah. like, anytime you have to come out and declare, yeah. I am I'm not a racist, you have fucked up badly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and well, exactly. I, yeah. And I was and, like, and, and that's the saw, best. And then I saw Truth. they, they, uh, <laughs> you know, they, and then they was like, oh, he's not, he adopted a black daughter. Oh God. Uh, what do you call it? No, he adopted Dino from uh, H Town. His daughter is that's his daughter. Now. Dino the legend. Shout out to Dino, Dino H. Down, yes, one of the best R&B singers that we've ever had. <laughs> yes, but, okay. yes, yes. Um, and I was just like, man, they're just pulling it out now. It's like, no, he's not. Look, he's just, they're he's carting just... the black child out <laughs> like, <laughs> here it is. It's just box braids. <laughs> yeah, I can't be a racist. I took her to get her braids done. It's just, you know, because of where we are now, we talk about it a lot here on the show, where we are now with free speech, with, um, it was different when we, uh, yeah. you know, when we were on, on television oh, in those days on television, um, just, you know, social media, no, yeah. it, it was, it, it's just different and, and you could have an impact. You could, I mean, stuff like that you rarely heard of, but I think now with this, it's, it's sped up. It's just sped up. You, you see more of everything and just, and you see more. When people talk about the world is 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 going to hell, <laughs> imagine if you had social media during the Revolutionary War. Oh, gosh. what that would have looked like. Yeah, during the Civil War, when I think twenty five thousand people were murdered in like mm -hmm. a twelve hour period. Mm -hmm. Just imagine, and and then we're talking about by hand. Yeah, you know, a couple cannons maybe, but you know. Yeah. And, Ding, 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 yeah. pop, you know, and then yeah. stab it. Uh, like, yeah. Imagine yeah. that on CNN Live. Yeah. You know, wow. People would say, what in the world is going on? You yeah. know, Aaron Burr murdered Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. So we haven't had a politician murder a politician. Right. So if those things were on social media, it would be different. But, you know, I am, I am really, uh, um, I recoil at this idea of cancel culture for this reason. And particularly, I recoil at the notion when everyone, when people say, all we need to stop with the super wokeness. Every time I hear James Carville criticizing the, the uber woke, it makes me cringe mm -hmm. because the idea of cancel culture was usually when someone on the right someone ultra conservative did something completely out of the box mm -hmm. and then didn't want to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, now you're coming to cancel me, all the woke folks. So that's how it became pejorative. Mm -hmm. No one uses woke in a pejorative sense except those who are trying to dodge accountability mm -hmm. for having done something they had no business doing. Right. Now, it is migrated to the point where now folks who are more progressive are using woke as 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 if it is pejorative as well, because woke has been on the right side of everything that's been right, progressive. There's nothing that in this hour of social justice that you believe should be supported, woke is on the side of that. 
And folks have taken it because it's been such a powerful movement and tried to position it to make it pejorative. And that's why I push back against that. So th this idea of, of cancel culture, when people talk about it as a free speech issue, that's not a sophisticated conversation either because the First Amendment is protecting you from persecution from the government. Mm -hmm. The government isn't trying to arrest anybody. The government's not trying to put you in jail for what you say. But if we're going to talk about freedom, and this is a sophisticated conversation that's mm -hmm. nuanced that you can't generally have with a mob, mm -hmm. there's no such thing as unlimited freedom, full stop. Mm -hmm. I'm as free as your rights are. So my freedom ends where they infringe upon your rights. That's where my freedom ends. Right. And when you understand I can, I'm free to throw my hands wherever I want until my hand smacks you in the face, right. suddenly my freedom is ended now, yeah. right? Likewise with free speech. I can't yell fire in a burning, in, I can't yell fire in, 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 a, in a build, in a crowded building. Mm -hmm. So once you acknowledge that there are limitations to freedom and free speech in a free society. Now we're talking about where do those lines exist. Right. But everybody needs to stop with this notion that there should be no consequences mm -hmm. for free speech because the point is, as long as the government isn't trying to persecute you, mm -hmm. if you say something that upsets me, I'm free to be upset. Mm -hmm. And if my anger at what you've said causes me to do something that you don't like, and if that is to boycott you or do something like that, that that's, that's the free market being a free market. You know, if people want to go out and have an advertisement and say, look, we want you to buy this and you go out and watch the commercial and you buy it, that's the free market working. So if someone says, I don't like Joe Rogan, I'm Neil Young, I want to pull my music, that's not cancel culture. He's free to do that. Yeah. And yeah. people have to understand that that's what we're talking about. When when I just watched, um, gosh, I can't say his name, but the head of the ACLU, who's a Jewish man who represented the Nazis when they wanted to march in Skokie, Illinois. Mm. His point was, look, it, it, it's, it, it made the Jewish community crazy. Mm. He said, but that's, you know, you, free speech is hard. You have to be able to protect their rights because sooner or later, if you don't protect theirs, they're not going to protect yours. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. So somehow there's been this confluence of this notion that freedom and freedom of speech is supposed to be absent consequences. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. You are you are entitled, like Joe Rogan's entitled. He can go around saying the N-word all day now. Yeah. Nobody's going to put him in jail for it, yeah. but people may stop listening to his podcast. Mm -hmm. People may choose to do other things. That's not, you know, those may be consequences of your action. But let me tell you something. If I walked into my boss today and said, hey, fuck face. <laughs> hey, we're out of here. <laughs> there you go. You up out of here. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and the question is, too, one, you can't cancel someone that you don't support. So right. a lot of, so, you know, if, if someone's not even supporting you, they don't have the power to cancel you because there are a group of people behind you that's probably going to keep supporting you anyway, i.e. Joe Rogan. Yeah. My, but, my bigger issue is, you know, a hundred million dollar contract. The owner of Spotify is worth three point eight billion, and artists are getting 0.2%. percent. But look, 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 we knew that before Joe Rogan. This whole thing, even yeah, started. I had an issue with that before that. Yeah, we knew all of this way before dating back, even when Title, when Jay Z was trying to come out with Title, mm -hmm. and people were mad at him. Yep. He kind of brought it up, like y'all mad at me. Yeah. Spotify only giving a point zero zero three cent on the dollar. Yeah, go look over there. Um, and, and so I, you know, I think you know, and, and besides maybe a small number or, or few, are people really even being canceled? Are they just being temporarily sidelined and then you know having to sit in the corner for a little while and then they get to come back and do their thing? A few people have been banished. Yeah, but besides that, <laughs> yeah. every, you ain't canceled. They'll be back. Give yeah. them a couple of years. They'll come back. You know, Louis C.K. is coming back. Get back. They're, they're folks that want to go out and see him, you know. But that that's, you know, that's an interesting scenario. So, for example, if 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 Louis C.K. sells tickets to a show mm -hmm. and a bunch of folks who don't like Louis C.K. come to the show and disrupt it, is that freedom of speech? 
Or are they now infringing on the rights of all the other folks who didn't want to be bothered? They wanted to hear the man and right. paid their money to hear the show. Right. That That's a real interesting situation. Yeah. I don't know how you deal with that. And one could say, well, when you pay to buy a ticket, you pay to be in the audience. Just like folks at an NBA game, if you get loud and obnoxious, they can throw you out. Yeah. So that probably is where that will come down. But he's going to he's gonna encounter that at some point. Yeah. Where, you know, folks who don't like him are going to try to disrupt. Yeah. And, you know, they'll deal with that. But this idea of, and the, the notion of, of free speech, the other one that you keep hearing about now is this idea that there's, we're, we're on the verge of a civil war. Yeah. I, I don't see that. And yeah. I certainly hope not. Right. And for a specific reason. I'm more worried about Russia and the Ukraine. But go ahead. Oh, well, that, 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 and that, that may have greater repercussions, <laughs> yeah. right? But this, you know, I, I remember I was talking with some other folks saying, look, this isn't, you know, 1776, where, you know, you want to take up arms against England with a musket. Right. If you decide to, wage war and everyone's talking about all the guns everybody's buying and you can go to the gun shop and you can get mm -hmm. you your shotguns and your sidearms all that um unless you have tanks uh a uh, black hawk helicopters <laughs> yeah. 50 caliber cannons yeah. and uh drones you're gonna lose in the civil war yeah. whoever's on the side of the mil military you are about to get smoked. Yeah. So I want you all to know all of the militia who took on and you know, had a standoff with the FBI and the ATF and so forth, they decided we're not coming to burn your house down. But y'all need to look at the video of what those drones did over there to the ISIS folks and say, if you want civil war, that's coming for you. Yeah. yeah. So we're not going to have civil war. We're not going to have a genocide in America. Yeah. You will you will find yourself on the wrong side of the U.S. military who will let you know. Uh, I, I will <laughs> I put it this way. Many years ago, and because it was private conversation, I will not attribute a comment, but no, say, right, right, right. <laughs> someone said, America spends more money on defense than the next how we, you know, four or five nations combined and they're all our allies, right? America at the time had a national debt in the billions. Now we're up to almost 30 trillion, trillion in dollars. debt. Yeah. Yet we keep spending money on national defense. Yeah. Say, so what is America telling the world? America's telling the world, we know we owe more money than we will ever be able to repay. Right. Try to come get it. <laughs> yeah. That, wow. that is the message yeah. that America is letting you know. Yeah. At some point, America has done for impoverished nations by doing what? Just forgiving their debt. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll be in our lifetime. Yeah. But at some point, China and all these other countries holding U.S. debt, America's going to say, I think we're just going to reset the clock mm -hmm. and we're going to wipe out our debt and start over. Mm -hmm. Because... 30 trillion is untenable. And it is unfortunate that so many people get pulled into this beef between Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, mm. and liberals. Because when you do that, it inflames your emotions. And that's what politicians want in order to drive you to vote. Right. The fact is, here in America, if you take Entitlements and entitlements are not welfare and food stamps. Mm -hmm. Entitlements are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Then take uh, Veterans Affairs, interest on the national debt, and the Department of Defense. Once you've done that, you have now evaporated over 85% of the U.S. income. You can't run a country on 15% of your income. Yeah. That's why we're in debt. And when everyone talks about you can't touch Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security because people will lose their mind because all these folks have it, it's money. That's why it's the only thing no party will touch because that is the real third rail. But that's the fact. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So the national debt, when now, when everyone used to have deficit hawks, we're going into 30 trillion in debt and nobody's talking about the deficit. They're like <laughs> Everybody laughed at Andrew Yang when he, when he ran for president and said, I'm going to pay every U.S. citizen $1,000. What did they do during the pandemic? We're gonna give you two thousand dollars. They just oh, I was like, let me see what Andrew talking about. Let me yes. hear a little more. Yes. He didn't. He didn't. He had nothing to follow up with. But I was like, what you? Yeah, let me yeah. elaborate. Yes, see, a thousand happened. a month. Yes. Yes. every two weeks. Oh, okay. that's right. All gear. That's right. And and suddenly now, no one cares about the debt. Economists are actually saying, well, look, since we're investing in America it's really going to pay back, kind of like TARP did when we saved the auto uh, industry and Mm. the airline industry. It's it's paying us back. So that's why we're not really worried about the debt. If you believe that, it's just the, the, until we address the simple fact that, like I said, before any discretionary decision is made in this country, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Veteran Affairs, interest on the national debt, and the Department of Defense, U.S. revenue is gone. That's why we're thirty trillion dollars in debt. So, yeah. this is not the conversation we were planning to have. But no, this, no, this, yeah. listen, listen, this is just the direction it listen, went. Listen, it, it is. It all is interwoven. All of it goes together. I yeah, think. because if, if it and here's the other thing. By the way, I I don't know since we're talking about. I'm gonna come back to entertainment. Hollywood is an interesting place, right? Now there's more content available on more platforms than ever. Netflix is going to spend what twelve billion dollars or twenty billion dollars on content alone this mm-hmm. year, just something like that. Yeah. And while I see a lot of other folks having opportunity, why does it feel like all that money's out there, but yet most folks' lives haven't really changed that much? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Why, why, why does it feel like that? Right? Like, where's all this money being spent, yeah. and who are they giving it to? Yeah. And you know, I I remember. I think I do know who it is, but I I I you know we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's really popular now, mm-hmm. but it still seems like you see directors of who are not of color, and they're you know they were making small films on on or shorts on YouTube. Right. And then all of a sudden they for their first feature film, it's a hundred and fifty million dollar budget. You're like, how did you get that movie? <laughs> what did you say in yeah. the room? I literally just had this conversation earlier yeah. today. It was us on a smaller scale. My homegirl literally texted me. We write we we're writing a show together. We both have our own shows that we've written and yeah. she's auditioning and she literally texted me and said, Girl, um, they just read they green lighting everything. This dude who got no credits literally got a show that's going to pilot and they're auditioning for it. And I was like, How the F he green get green lights? She was like, girl, I don't know. Like they, they just literally It wow. happens. Be, <laughs> you just green light. You, you just it's relationships and whatever. You, I just wonder sometimes when you and and here's the other thing. We have all watched on Netflix, Amazon, everywhere. We watched some movie that was trash. Mm-hmm. It was just garbage. It was, I mean, it wasn't made well, direction was well, the performances, mm-hmm. garbage. And it's not like there's one or two, there are dozens of them. Yeah, they right? got a whole section. And you just go, how did they get that made? Yeah. Like, who did they pitch this to? And somebody said, I'm going to give you the money for that. Yeah. Go out and make yeah. it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. where did that happen? I just want to be in that room once yeah. to say, I'm going to give you $20 million to make some garbage. Yeah. And, it, and it feels like, uh, and, and it's not to say that, you know, I feel blessed and highly favored for all the opportunity I've been yeah. given and have, yeah. right? But I, I, you just marvel at those who seem to be successful when you feel like I'm always trying to do better. Mm. I want to see how can I push myself to be excellent? Right. How can I, I, I know that the work that I respect and the artists I love who've influenced me. And I, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to write better than Maya Angelou. I want to, I want to write better than Aaron Sorkin. I want to mm-hmm. direct better. I want to write music better than John Williams. You know, mm-hmm. I, I want to do better than them, right? Yeah. And then the other folks are like, I ain't trying to do better than none of them. I'm just trying to get a check. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. Yeah, hey, man. And, and look, <laughs> and if your goal is to get a check, your goal is to get a check. Yeah. The question is, though, 
how do you get access to the check? Uh, and and maybe it's it is the going back to the earlier conversation, mm-hmm. right? It is um, this idea that some demographics just ain't allowed to put up their shows. Everything has to be. Um, you know, Emmy nominated or, you know, or has to be pigeonholed into this the type of demographic that yeah. we like, yeah. right? It got to yeah. be 50 Cent, got to produce it and it got to be, you know, on stars or yeah. or something like that. Maybe in, in the the gatekeepers are that simple minded or maybe it's the the now the new renaissance and we just got to do our own thing and find a way out of nowhere. Which, uh, which listen, it, you know, even though, yeah, the series are based on drugs or or what I, I i still i i still could not separate that from 50 cent i i couldn't take that from him i couldn't acknowledge that yo he's done something oh yeah he, he and courtney kemp has done something that is i mean like it is pretty incredible mm-hmm. oh he's bona fide pretty oh, yeah. incredible 50 is like, bona fide yeah don't, and, I, and don't. now they, they have the uh in snoop they're working on murder was the case so it's going to be, uh, uh, I believe, it's either the story of, you know, that whole thing would happen uh, when Snoop went on trial. Uh, I believe it's that. I'm not sure. But just the fact that it's just another one, though. It's just because, listen, we don't get many, D. We don't get many. Let, it's let, just like when we were on UPN. P- they complained. People complained. Our community complained, complained. But UPN had made more black millionaires because there were a lot of people that got paid a lot of money. Listen, I know my second go around at UPN, I got paid a lot of money. And now we have, no, we don't have that. Let me tell you something. I, there, of the things that I marvel at, I, I don't think I've ever met Snoop. Mm-hmm. I've been, I was at the American Music Awards mm-hmm. when Snoop one, I think, for Gin and Juice. And mm-hmm. I thought it was so yeah, great. Yeah, I played ball with him. Since that's my dude. Uh, so I, I've never met him. And and of all the things, you know, Snoop coaching Pee Wee football, just, but you got to think, Snoop has gone from, you know, gangster hip hop to doing Martha Stewart commercials. It's you know, it's just, it's, it's just, brilliant. it's spectacular. I was like, <laughs> it's brilliant. And, 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 you know, he is, he is, he is, he hadn't changed at all, right. right? Yeah. You know, I just like over, over COVID, and they hit, and Snoop posted all the videos screaming at EA because the yeah. service went down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, it don't, it, it doesn't even matter. It's like, you know, some folks are like, do you realize you're doing commercials with Martha Stewart? Like, you can't be that guy anymore. Right. Snoop was like, yes, I can. And, you know, yeah, he's yeah. exactly. And the you type. know, you know who else, who else's career I marvel at? Very few people can be successful in a G-rated universe mm-hmm. and an R-rated universe and have those two audiences coexist mm-hmm. and not get any pushback. Ice Cube. The Rock. The Rock. Oh, oh yeah. The Rock is doing, oh, he's yeah. doing movies wearing a tutu and ballet and then he's like, fuck Kevin Hart. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, yeah. And it's all yeah. in the same place. Yeah, yeah. And it's Fabulous, and yeah. then he's doing you know the Titan Games, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. inspirational. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's buying people trucks, and he's yeah. got a daughter, and he's doing, it. and it's just oh, he's he's killing. Yeah, it. he's killing. It. And, and to go back to what you said about um, you know, with Snoop and 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 Fifty and what they're doing, like the reinvention to me is is, is amazing. Ice Cube again it was one of the early early adapters of that. Um, yeah, and. Watching him, watching Snoop, and now watching Ice T. Watching Ice T in a Cheerios commercial, walking with the o- older women, I'm just like, yo, how, how, like that is that that's the greatness I think of this business when you can make it work like that. I think it's great. See, here here's a with with Ice T's transformation. While I acknowledge that is less less uh, uh, impactful to me only for this reason. And it's one of the things that Ice-T said that I always love. Mm-hmm. When he talked about, I'm tired of watching rappers in videos, in cars they don't own, homes that aren't theirs, mm-hmm. and women that ain't theirs. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm tired of that. Yeah. He said, in all of y'all, when I was rapping, 
I was rapping about what I used to do. Right. Y'all think you can become a rapper and then become a gangster. Like, right. that's not how it works. Right. So right. Ice's career was always like post-gangster. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas, whereas Cube, Cube was like, we was, we were NWA like, at the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. he was like, you know, when I watched the movie and they talked about when they went into Jerry's office and broke it with bats, he was yeah, like, yeah. we shouldn't have done it, but we did it. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's like, that's But, but we his too was post the G side. Yeah, the, are, are we there yet? All that, that was, that was post as well. Let me tell you something. The fact that uh, still. We just didn't see, we didn't have the opportunity, I think, to see enough of Ice T, the other stuff that you know, what that's, that may you know, be true. I, we didn't have because of where we are now with everything. We didn't. Oh. We but Ice T put in work. <laughs> he Cube, put in work. Cube is one of my favorite MCs of all time, mm -hmm. all time. And of the battle rap songs, No Vaseline is probably oh, on the Mount gosh. Rushmore of that just is. talking about. Breaking folks down. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it was my favorite scene in the movie when Dre and all of them were listening. They were like, yeah. this is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, was, that was brilliant. Yeah. But I'm like, Cuba's going from that to doing, you know, are we are there, we there yet? yet? It's yeah. just it's yeah. spectacular. It's spectacular. Yeah. I love it. I, I love it, man. Yeah. Um, and and, and that, that duality and being able to, to jump back and forth. And, and I lead that into, you know, even with you, I know you stepped into the stand up world for a minute yep. a few years ago. Um, is that something you want to return to, or, or and what and what and what was your because pe a lot of people don't understand, you know, what it you know stand not saying that you didn't understand it, yep. but stand up, it's it's de it's demanding. I, I kicked myself in the ass because I took so much time off. You know, when I mm -hmm. when I did uh, uh, one on one, I I tried to go out. I was like, ah, this is too much. I don't want to be away from my. You know, at that time we just had our daughter. I'm like, I don't want to be away that long and, and, and come back and then she's 15. You know what I'm saying? You know, DL was like, nigga, you apologize with some money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> DL told me, he said, I'll apologize later. But yeah. um, uh, I, I, I just, I, if there's a regret I, I, I would have, would, would, would be that, not staying at it even during that whole time because I believe that that would have been further because now I got to dip in dip out you got this and just when i was just starting back getting going then COVID hits and how do you uh even though that wasn't your background how do you uh you know you fix that that mechanism within yourself so this is really interesting uh, for all stand-up comedians stand-up comedians will many of them will argue stand-up is the purest form of entertainment because you got nothing but you and a microphone that's it you don't get special effects. You don't get a script. You don't get, you, you either succeed or you bomb. I think there are arguments to be made that, you know, irrespective of, you know, while a stand-up comedian, no one can be Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, Bill Cosby, right. George Carlin. At the same time, you don't, don't, none, I don't think any of them are going to be Jeremy Irons, Daniel Day Lewis, Denzel Washington, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, it, they're different mm -hmm. skill sets. Mm -hmm. uh, each each having its own capacity to be that Michael Jordan moment when you just so yeah. in the zone and you float, mm -hmm. right? For me, I started stand up mostly out of a frustration because I had already done a different world. I had done uh probably homeboys. Yeah. It is post homeboys. Um, I, I'd been cast in a dying English pilot that didn't go. I was, there was, they were going to do a TV version of the movie soap starring Carol Burnett. And I was going to be the director. Oh, and mm -hmm. it was going to be great. But then Carol decided she didn't want to do it. Um, and so that didn't go. So, you know, there were all these pilots where things were close to, mm -hmm. and, uh, I did a, a Jim Burroughs pilot called mm -hmm. Beverly Hills SUV. Mm. And it was about a Beverly Hills uh, car dealership with Henry Winkler and oh, Aaron wow. Cater and Mel Rodriguez. And it was really wow. funny. And it's one of the few Jim Burroughs pilots that didn't get picked up. And it was, it's a long story to that. Yeah. Jim did two pilots that year. Jeff Goldblum was the other pilot. 
And neither one of Jim Burroughs' pilots got picked up. Wow. And that's just, if you know the history of Jim Burroughs, yeah. like, that's rare, yeah. right? Um, and working with Jim Burroughs was fabulous. He was terrific. Uh, Larry Wilmore wrote the pilot. Hmm. Um, so having had all these experiences that were great with a lot of really talented folks, you know, you keep seeing this, you know, your, your agent calls it, Daryl, we got a series regular role paying the best friend of fill in the blank stand up comedian I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, who is this? <laughs> I, 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 I've been on 15 shows and whatnot. Why yeah. am I coming in for the best friend of somebody that nobody knows? <laughs> like, you know, what, what is this? Right? And why am I auditioning for him? Yeah. Right? So I just found that to be frustrating. And, you know, I tell young actors, you have to, you need to find in this industry, whatever your cross is to bear, whatever that's going to be. Mm -hmm. so, so when you're in school, acting is unlimited. So you can, you might be in a play where you could play Lady Macbeth or you could play any kind of role you mm -hmm. want. When you were in the real world, it doesn't work like that. I am five foot seven. I'm a light skinned black man. I will never be cast Superman. Not going to happen. Mm. So I need to get over that right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and the same thing to be said, Ned Beatty was one of the great character actors of all time. Yeah. Ned Beatty was not going to be cast as Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. Mm. Wasn't going to happen. The same reason Sylvester Stallone went out and made Copland for scale because he said he couldn't get a movie done where he wasn't playing like a superhero, you know, the, the, the action guy. Right. And he wanted to do a drama. Right. Michael Bay did the movie with The Rock and Mark Wahlberg the, about the, it was based on the true story where they were the bodybuilders and they kidnapped somebody. Yeah. But he had been trying to do that movie, they said, for like 10 years. Wow. And couldn't get it done until finally they wanted him to do like Transformers 3. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay, only if you give me 20 million to make this movie. And The Rock and Mark were already attached to it. Wow. So when you see that everyone has some sort of challenge that they have to deal with, you have to find out what yours is. So for me, my career has gone where I have always been able to audition for series regulars on half-hour comics. I don't ever get calls for guest stars, ever. Like, I don't get them. And I rarely get called for dramatic roles of any kind and never a series regular on a dramatic show, ever. And I never get called in to be a bad guy. They say I'm too cute and too funny. Like literally, that's what casting directors. <laughs> I, I, you can't believe it. This is a real thing. Like yeah, you, yeah. I did a Roger Corman film where I played a pimp. It is Terry Vaughn's first role, and I beat her ass on Martin Luther King's birthday. Oh All right? Literally, I have got to find it that. is Black Scorpion. It's, oh, it's oh, I'm, Black Scorpion yeah. is the movie. Yeah. Is that, it on Amazon Prime? It, like, where is it? It probably is. <laughs> Joe, Joe said, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to give y'all a little hint. Y'all go find the movie. Now, step off. <laughs> That's all I'm going to give you. Go, go, go wait till you find that. Black Scorpion, Ooh, Joe, Joe Severance, that. Rick, uh, Rick Rasanovich from Top Gun is in it. Garrett Morris was in it. We did that together. Wow. Uh, and it's Terry Vaughn's first role as she was playing a prostitute. And we were shooting on Martin Luther King's birthday. <laughs> and I had to beat Terry Vaughn and rape a white woman on the, <laughs> on the same day for this Roger Corman movie, playing a pimp. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> this was the only way I could get a role that was outside of my, you know, Oh my God! No, it Kevin. looks like there's a Black Scorpion too. As yes, well. there so was. Oh yeah, my and God. there was a series. Yeah, there was a series. But my pimp character is what turned Joan Severance into the Black Scorpion the, oh, to, to stop my, my crime spree. God, right? So <laughs> I'm watching that. Yeah. Oh, you got to see it. It's it's cl <laughs> classic Roger Corman, right? So all of that said, I was so frustrated by all these stand-up comics getting deals. I was like, well, I'm going to go do some stand-up. If that's what I need to do to you know, get a yeah. deal, that's what's going to start. So that's why I, I went to start do stand-up. Mm. And the first night that I got a chance to do stand-up, Kim Whitley and Buddy Lewis invited me to the Ha Ha Cafe. Mm -hmm. I went up on stage, and I burned the house down. Burned it down. I killed. And I remember Kim looked at me afterwards. She said, you've never been on stage before? Wow. I was like, no. Today was the first day. Wow. 
Well, needless to say, the next time. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> yes. The next time I was on set, I did not kill. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I think they wanted to kill me. Right? They like, Ron ain't funny. You know, it's just something like that. It was something it was like that. And I I actually got heckled and almost booed off the stage oh, at like a red robin restaurant. Oh, shit. <laughs> Not the restaurant, not the <laughs> yeah. not the open yes. mic, uh, yes. open mic stage. Open uh. mic at no, it wasn't open. It wasn't it open was a book mic. Show? Oh. It was a book show, and and y'all will never believe of one of the things oh. I can say about the stand up community because almost all the guys knew me, right? Yeah, everybody was great to me. You, Royale, yeah. Chris Spencer. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, uh, oh gosh, why can't I say James's last name? Who passed away? Um, Hannah James Hannah yeah. yes yeah. James Hannah was yeah. always really kind to me yeah. I can't tell you yeah. how many you know stand ups were really cool and it's where I used to see Joe Rogan all the time because right. I would go down to just be at the comedy store all the time yeah. and it's when uh, uh, why can't I say Bobby's last name uh, Asian stand up comic uh, Lee Bobby Lee yes mm-hmm. and you know so yeah. you know when they would work there and, and Eddie Griffith would you know Take the 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 blue room and just be there all night. Yeah. Everybody, like, I don't know what y'all showed me life for. I ain't getting off. You know, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, one, yeah, yeah. Eddie would do one of his uh, marathons and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, everyone was really nice. But that that night that I did the red robin and, and got heckled, and I remember afterwards, this one guy came up to me. And he was like, "Man, this is not your audience." And I, I'm assuming that if y'all need to bleep. No. And, oh, okay. So, because this was this was a black audience, he was like every comment was like, "Nigga fucking shit, <laughs> nigga fucking shit, <laughs> nigga fucking shit." And my yeah. act was, you know, I I talked about how the diaspora and the <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly right. I I, I I I did this thing about how I went to uh, I I said uh, um, it always is funny you see on the news these stories where everybody's shooting up the office. Mm-hmm. And after they shoot up the office, they interview the people who work there. And they said, Robert, I can't believe he did this. He used to come every day and just sit in the corner. He was quiet. He always had lunch by himself. Mm. I can't believe he did this. Uh, well, there you go. The person who's sitting by himself, uh-huh. they're going to shoot up yeah. the office, right? Yeah. Segway that little bit into, I went to go see, true story, the recut version of The Exorcist. Oh. At a midnight show Ooh. at the Chinese Man Theater. Oh my God. As I'm waiting for the show to start, a man and a woman walk in with their newborn, a three year old, and like a five year old to the midnight show of The know? Exorcist. I still won't watch that movie. Yeah, I don't. I and, I, and I'm like, it's what are scary. y'all doing? This, yeah. You know, it's just there are some parents that are so stupid. Like, these kids don't know that they're being abused, right? right? I right. said, we need to have like a slap patrol where we right. can all just come up and take turns, form a line, and slap the spit right. out of their mouth, right? right? And just one by one, go right. up. In the middle of the movie, when the new edited version with Linda Blair's going down the stairs, crawling backwards. The little girl turns from the screen. She's like, mommy. And her mother did not embrace her. She said, shh. <laughs> like she's oh, just like, shut up. I'm no. trying to watch the movie. And I'm like, oh my, oh my God. God. I said, and I was like, <laughs> and I said, look, y'all need to understand how serious this is. Yeah. I said, the exorcist is not Jason. Yeah. It's not Friday the 13th. Yeah. The Exorcist is about the devil. Uh-huh. Yeah. And if you believe in God, mm-hmm. then you have to believe in the devil. Mm-hmm. And in The Exorcist, the God, God was testing the faith mm-hmm. of those around them mm-hmm. by taking possession of this eight-year-old girl. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's all quiet in here now. There ain't uh, nobody <laughs> laughing, right? And then, but this was part of the right, act. I'm right. like, oh, y'all came in here for some jokey jokes. I'm like, Especially y'all see? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, this is some serious <laughs> shit now, right? right, y'all, right, right. Nobody thinks it's funny. Yeah. I was like, well, that's what was so bad that this little girl, yeah. it was her. She yeah. was seeing what this devil was doing. Right. right. So I said, so what's going to happen is this little girl going to grow up. She's going to have all kind of issues. She's going to get a job. She's going to sit by herself, be in the corner. She's going to shoot up the office. Yeah. You know, so there was the callback. Right. That was my act. 
Oh shit, nigga, fuck, didn't want to hear that. <laughs> Can't do that after the they, nigga they job. Did, oh, they did not want to hear not that at, at all. Do you know who booked me there and who also booked me at his room at Hollywood Park? Cat Williams. Wow. Cat was hooking me up all the time. And right after he heard this happen, he ran out to me. He was like, are you okay? Are you all right? He's yeah. like, yeah, I'm fine. You need anything? You need some money? You need it? I'm like, yeah. no, I'm good. Cat Williams was always gracious to me. Yeah. Anywhere he held Kat, a room, yeah. he would he would bring me in. And, yeah. you know, at the beginning, and, you know, Chris was, Chris Spencer was doing, whenever Chris would go, like, do multiple rooms, yeah. I would go, you know, yeah. around with Same. Chris to all the, all the different places. Yeah. So, you know, that's what, and, and what I found from doing stand-up was that it really helped me with my writing. Mm-hmm. And suddenly now I was, I was and, and it helped me be critical of other folks' writing. And one of the things now, even in the projects that I produce and try to co-write now, I tell young writers, you have to know who you like. Mm-hmm. You have to know writers you like. And you'll find those who inspire you. Aaron Sorkin's one of my favorite writers. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also need to know who you don't like. And you need to know why you don't like them. Right. Because that really will help submit your voice and help you find a style that that really suits you. Right. Uh, I, I thought it was really important. And that happened for me while I was doing stand-up. So, right. you know, that time, and I still have all my joke books where yeah, I write yeah. everything down. Yeah. But the, the flip side to that is, uh, and the reason why I wasn't doing not because I didn't enjoy doing it, not because, you know, like everybody else, you got to go out there and yeah. have good nights and bad. But a stand-up's life sucks. Yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard craft. <laughs> oh, it's it's all the it's hours are yeah. awful. You you're you're up all night. Yeah. It's just awful. If you yeah. want it, if you want no life, you can live the life of a stand-up doing the clubs late at night, fighting yeah. for five minutes to get on stage here, then yeah. go down the road, have to do that, try to get booked out of town and then go on the road there. I know lots of stand-ups here in LA who are like, I don't even work in LA. I only work out of town. Right, you know, it, right. it's just I don't want to deal with the division between the improv, the comedy right, store, and, right. and you know, there's like all all those sort of behind the scenes issues mm-hmm. that stand-ups are like, this is this is the the dark side of stand up. Yeah, that, that's really difficult. It, it definitely yeah. in New York, man, that was the great thing about New York is performing there and you can go and do two, three shows a night, man. You can make, I made a great living doing stand up in New York. But, you know, you're younger, there's really no responsibility. You got no kids, you got kids. no wife, you know, all you know, these things. Now, yeah. shit, I'm sleepy at 9 30. Like, yeah. 9 30, I'm it's like. It's a decision, right? Yeah. It's a decision. And you made, you had to make it when you were doing TV and you yeah. had you had your daughter when she was young. A yeah. lot of comics make the decision, hey, I check in with you. Like you said, DL <laughs> said, I'm going to pay you. I'll pay you later and apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, you, you are there all night. It's a very grimy, gritty, um, craft and mm-hmm. I think that may be why a lot of stand-ups feel like they are the superior performer mm-hmm. because they're like I had to go through this yeah, <laughs> yeah. to get here mm-hmm. I'm pro- I'm you know I'm peak uh, talent I've survived the yeah hazy. I've survived because you <laughs> yes. literally yeah. have survived and, and I think the thing is, for me is it's I did. I went through that already. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. I did that. You right. Know, I got. I stepped on stage in 1989. I grinded the shit out of this game you know what i mean and you get to a point you get a show then you're like oh okay you know you made it but then it's like no you still got to keep going that's when the grades even become greater and going i think it's tough going back and saying i got to go back to that grind and you don't have the patience no more you don't have i had a young comic come up to me at the laugh factory laughed at me because i still had a book i like to write i like the pages I like to have a book. Mm-hmm. He had his phone. You should have slapped him with the book. <laughs> wow, yeah. get he out of here. Phone, you know. What I got a book. Say, yo, OG, yo, OG, yo, unk. You ain't you, you. You put it in here. You know that, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm good, man. I, 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 I'm like, how old are you? He told me. I was like, I was like, wow, wow. You, you wasn't even like a thought when I started doing right. stand-up. And you could have, you, you could have really checked him because oh, it's yeah, it's comics who are. Young, yeah. my age, younger, who still got joke books. Yeah. Like, stop, stop this. I'm not gonna be tech shamed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it was just yeah. it, you know it, whoop him. It, yeah. yeah, it just it it wasn't something that you know I was gonna be like oh my god, but right. it was just like 
man, this is where we are now. No, like, no, that, <laughs> that, that's when you say, no, I don't keep my notes here, but I do unlock my house <laughs> yeah. from my phone. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Um, <laughs> but the grind, though, the the and I think, and I go back to you know Chris Spencer. I was talking about him because he was definitely one of the main people to say, hey, man, come on. Like he has shows going on the road. Come on, boom, we'll get you a ticket. You're gonna go, and it just. And and I think it's how it ended up me. When I ended up meeting you, mm, was it um was it, at the comedy union? Comedy it was sometime union. around was the comedy, the comedy union. union. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was getting back on the ends. I got to shout out ends. Uh, uh, ends Mitchell Mitchell mm-hmm. at the comedy union. That, Always would have me there too. That dude, man, just he said flex whatever you want to give it. Just come, just whatever you want to do a night. Just come. Yep. And I would always go and do a flex and friends and host and. I met Keneally there. I met Tony Baker there. I met um, uh, Tahir Moore there. A lot of these younger comedians that just, mm-hmm. that I love their style, you know, and what they were saying. Like, you know, Keneally's voice. There's a there's a couple of other uh, uh, female comics that I just, the voice in their perspective. It's not mm-hmm. just about, you know, come up in here and smash this. And, you know, it's... it's a lot it, of it <laughs> is. Yeah, you know, and, and, and if that's for you, cool, but... Um, I just appreciated that, and, and, and Tony Baker is one of my favorites. Like, really, one of my favorites. Um, just that grind again. That I think is you mentally now have to prepare at this season stage in my in my life, mm-hmm. uh, in our lives. You know, you just gotta say, man, do I really want to? Like, I gotta sit there and be like, with, with so the, by the time yeah. I go to such and, and such you grind, again, it's a different type of grind now. Yeah. It's more strategic. Yeah, it's like okay, if I'm already out. <laughs> Yeah, if I'm already out drinking, yeah. then I can come over here and hang out for an hour. But I'm only doing an hour because I got to get back home yeah. and, and get in that bed. I went it, was, out last... it was only Jay Leno and Bill Cosby who had reached, you know, that uber success level yeah. and yet still kept doing, like, dates all year round. Yeah. Uh, and one gets... And, and wait, uber success outside of stand-up comedy. Right. So, you, I mean, you can still look at, like... Um, Jeff Dunham and other, you know, the other, yeah, yeah, suit, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Gabriel and Glaces, but Gabe has got success outside. Yeah. But I'm saying that um, most comedians, once they've achieved a level of success, mm. it's, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know that he said it specifically because Eddie has always toyed with doing another special. Right. But hey, like I make movies. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I got nothing else to prove. And yeah. you know, I you know, doing an hour special. Look, I I could be wrong. But you know, even watching Dave Chappelle's last specials, mm-hmm. Dave has gotten and he like he says, I'm just so good at this now, right? Yeah. It's not like hours. Dave did what like Jer- when Jerry Seinfeld chronicles how he spent a year putting his set together right. and how he went out and bombed. And all. Right. That's not what Dave is doing. Right. Dave is going on stage and what you get from Dave is what Dave had to come to talk to you about that day. Right. And Dave is going to tell it to you in a funny way right. and we're going to record it. But it's not like I'm going to do seven months of working out this material because I don't think that's what Dave did to no, get there. No, Dave, that's one thing I will say. Dave is in them clubs Oh, no. Still. Oh, he's oh, yeah. but working, Dave, not, he, working he, those materials, working yes, that material. But I'm saying Dave yeah. goes to clubs all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's crafting that set the same way. So he might be doing things together, not the way, like most comedians, when they're working on their 90-minute special. Right. You can put a book stamp by they're doing this, that, and the other. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Like, like Kevin yeah. Hart, how he does that. You right. know Kevin about to record something else because he started booking his dates back to back. He get on the road. He, yes. do, he go yeah. back his yeah. rounds and then yeah. he does the special. Yeah, because I went yeah. to see Dave. Uh, it, you know, he it was a couple of jokes in his bed that he, you know, was kind of just, you know, touching on. and But then, you know, he goes off on a tangent and talking and blah, blah, boom, 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 and they come back. But it's masterful. to It, it really is masterful mm-hmm. to watch. I, you know, look, uh, and and, how, and since when was, when did Chris put out Tambourine? Oh, maybe 2016. Something like that. Exactly. It's, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. You know, Chris didn't, yeah. Chris didn't out there doing it like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, uh, because, you know, again, it's nice working on a movie set. Yeah. <laughs> 2018. Yeah. 2018. Yeah, 2018. 2018. There you I think go. for those guys, I do think even with Chris, I, I, I'm pretty sure he's, because he's, he's gotten back out in the last year. He's kind of like stepped back. I, 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 I'm pretty sure he would be preparing to try to do something because he, he, those guys, they just, even at this stage, man, like that stand up for them 
is 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 like water. But but that's what for for all of the the masters of the craft, all of the masters of the craft. It, it's and and I've heard this from multiple masters, mm -hmm. and they say when younger comedians watch them, and when they first come on stage to the crowd, and for example, like when Bill Maher and his show, excuse me, Bill Maher every week starts to show a, oh, I know why you're happy this week. Like he, every week and the audience always laughs mm -hmm. and young comics will say, see, you know, you got built in laughs. They are, they're already pre, you know, determined to mm -hmm. laugh at you. And he's like, yeah, cause I earned that motherfucker. I've been <laughs> yeah. doing this for a hundred years. Yeah. I earned that. <laughs> yeah. You got to earn it yourself. And right. it's the same with all of those guys. So there's a degree to which, so for example, you know, when, when we were just starting a different world in 1987, Kadeem and I would go with Damon Wayans every night when Damon would go to the comedy store. Yeah. And th that's when I saw that, that was how I was first introduced to behind the scenes with comedians. Cause Damon would just walk in they get, they let Damon, you know, when he come in, they find him and mm -hmm. Damon would just get up on stage like, what do I want to talk about tonight? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wow, you know, yeah. you could just sit up there and just wing it. And, you know, he'd have his notebook and I don't think Damon recorded all of his. Mm -hmm. I don't think he did, but you just saw him there working it yeah. out. And uh, on any given night, he would say stuff that was really funny, or he's like, "Yeah, I probably won't use that." You know, yeah, he's yeah. just watching him work yeah. it out on stage. I saw Adam Sandler at the Ha Ha do that. He went up there, literally had a paper, and just like he was just like it was almost in that same voice of uh, the way Adam uh, likes to talk. Yeah, uh, uh, not that one, but the what's the, what's the in in uh, the wedding scene when he's like. You know, really, yeah, yeah. He was like, hey, yeah, I probably won't use that one again. Because it sucks! Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, 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 it just, just watching him, man, was, it was dope. And he has, he has some funny stuff in there. So I, I'm thinking like, okay, maybe he's working on a special, but I never saw anything else again. And that was, God, that was pre-pandemic. Some yeah. people just need to get out. Once you've been doing something for so long, it becomes a habit or you just need to feel, fulfill that need. Or you working on something like look at mm -hmm. like Jay Leno. Jay Leno is back in the trenches. He be at Flappers damn near almost every, every night every week. for the last six, seven, eight months. Wow. Just working out his material, doing his set, whatever he's preparing for. Right. But he be there and wow. he take his butt home at 10 o'clock. <laughs> you, you, know, <laughs> you know what's funny about Jay Leno? Uh, I, you know, because for years, everyone thought Jay was Jay's humor was just so sweet and saccharine. Mm -hmm. Right. And after the the battle with him and Letterman over succeeding Johnny, is when and because I did the Tonight Show when when it was still the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, but right. Jay was guest host. Right. So the, I I did it with Jay. But I remember I think it was after that Letterman beef that that's when Jay's humor started to get a little more bite. Mm -hmm. You know, I I just think if you've been through some stuff that mm -hmm. makes you angry, you know, it's got mm -hmm. a little more bite. And I. Bite and a little more risque mm -hmm. because I and I remember the joke that made me go, Oh my gosh, was that Jay Leno? Mm -hmm. Because it was when uh, I want to say it was the, the it was the recall of Gray Davis when Arnold Schwarzenegger was running, but mm -hmm. everybody was running, like Gary Coleman was running for, mm -hmm. for governor, mm -hmm. everybody was there, and there was a porn star. And Jay Leno's joke was, Whatever the it, it wasn't Stormy Daniels. He was like, of all the candidates running, Stormy Daniels is the only candidate whose hole has already been punched. Uh, I was like, oh, Jay. Yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. Did he just do this on the Tonight yeah. Show? And I was like, okay, so it's not it's not old school Jay anymore. Yeah, he's he's yeah. letting you have it. Yeah, you got to, you know, I, I think stepping out, you know, taking those risks are uh, – that's essential, man. To especially stand up, you, you you have to. And speaking of that, I don't know if you're gonna do that with stand up, but what are you working on now? If you can speak on it, what are you currently putting down the pipe? I know you're writing. Uh, I'm. I am. I had sold the pilot to Amazon. Mm -hmm. We're you know we're still hopeful that that has a, a future in it. Mm -hmm. I also have a an hour a drama that is. Looking to find a home, mm -hmm. so we're, we're I'm out pitching that. Uh, Kadeem and I 
as I sit here, we might start doing a podcast together. Oh, we've been nice. wanting to, we've been wanting to do a podcast forever. Oh, that would be so dope. Yeah, and and it 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 started again. It came up again when um when I was doing House Husbands of Hollywood. Uh-huh. Not to be confused with the real, real husbands, husbands of Hollywood. I remember that right? one. So uh we did a segment there where Kadeem and I went into, uh, because the producer of that show, our husband is a music composer Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he had a studio at the house. So Kadeem and and I, Kadeem and I went into his studio and we were, because we wanted to do a sports podcast initially Mm -hmm. because we, you know, like everybody, we argue about sports right? and we were, I, I swear we were. Season ticket holders for the Clippers before oh, I remember. I remember. Billy Crystal and Penny Marsh. I remember. Right? And Donald Sterling, before, you know, yeah. Donald uh-huh. Sterling, used to come to me and Kadeem and ask our advice on everything. Wow. And and so, and, and it started because, you know, back then, every, you know, the, the Clippers were not good, but. The Clippers always had good players, but for some reason, yeah. you know, they they you know they would always leave and go and win the championship, right, or we get the stars when their career was over. So yeah. like when Dominic Hawkins, I mean Dominic Wilkins, came, you know his career was at the end. When yeah. Sean Kemp came to the Clippers, yeah. career was at the end. Um, but every star of every opposing team would stop and talk to me and Kadeem. So it'd be Michael Jordan or mm-hmm. uh, you know Patrick Ewing, whoever of mm-hmm. the all the opposing teams that always come and give us a pound. And one day. Donald Sterling, whose seats were down, you know, he sat in the middle. We were like at the foul line uh, in the front row. We had mm-hmm. the Jack, we were the Jack Nicholsons of the Clippers. Mm-hmm, I remember. And <laughs> and Donald Sterling was coming back from halftime. And I think we were talking with um, it was either Sean Kemp or Glenn Robinson or somebody. <clears throat> and Donald Sterling just cut into the conversation. He's like, who the fuck are you? And why does everybody talk to you? That's just wow. how he, that's just how he cut in. So we had to explain who we were uh-huh. and why everybody knew us. You know, we work on television. Most of these guys are our friends and whatnot. Uh-huh. And from that point on, we just started talking basketball with him every game. Wow. And he would come and ask our, our opinions. Um, uh, so we, we had talked about wanting to do a, a sports show because he thinks he knows everything. And, I try to explain to him, he only knows what I've told him. <laughs> and, and he will tell you, but he's forgotten more than I'll ever know. Yeah, so, yeah, you know yeah. we, uh, so we had, we called Norm Nixon, who usually would referee all of right. our arguments, and say, let me tell you how both of y'all don't know nothing. Right. And let me tell you what a player's perspective is. So yeah. we did a, this little uh, segment where we talked with Norm and talked about all of our years together right. and, and what we found. And um, Ahmad was somebody else. Ahmad Rashad, when we would see him, we'd have these same conversations. Right. And somebody put that clip up on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I think in a day it had like almost 30,000 views, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and one of the last comments when somebody sent it to me was from Quest Love, who was like, I have to hear this podcast. Y'all have to do this. Mm-hmm. So we're we're looking, you know, we'll, we'll probably do that. Dwayne and Ron, that's it. Oh, Dwayne yeah. and Ron. Only if we want to get sued by Carsey Warner. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Right? You um, really couldn't say Dwayne and Ron? You really couldn't? No, you can't use the character name. Wow. Dang. We yeah, we can't. Dang. No. And, and so I couldn't be Tiberius? No. No, you could not. <laughs> I've already told Kadeem, I'm not sure if it's going to be the K and D podcast uh-huh. or the D and K podcast. Uh-huh. And the way we're going to put the K before the D. Yeah, the D and K. Yeah, I would do the K, <laughs> then the D. Yeah, Don't well, do the other way around. I'm or or the Daryl and Kadeem or Kadeem and Daryl. Yeah, we got it. That, that, yeah, that way, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you don't have the DK. Yeah. But the, the I said the way we're going to settle it. We're oh gonna find god. somebody who has a, he's snorting. 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 Oh my god. <laughs> that was tickled. That was <laughs> the DNK podcast. Yeah, that got me. That got you. Okay, uh we're gonna go find an old uh techno bowl and we're gonna play for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's dope. We're gonna bring out Techno Bowl. That, man, that that yeah. would be that would be dope. I I know you'd have a lot of people. You know, even just outside of sports, but I know you guys probably talk about all the time other stuff and just the different world stuff. That'd be great. I, you know, I, I, we, we think I'm similar to what you guys are doing. You know, we would want to interview all our friends, yeah. you know, yeah. whether yeah. from music, film, television, yeah. politics. You know, yeah. we want to interview all our friends. Just invite them on and 
talk about stories that people don't know anything about and things that we've done and yeah. uh, you know, behind the scenes, you know, but no, no one will ever know. I, I, I Kadeem and Michael Jordan were friends. I, I want to, I don't know if Kadeem met Mike first or if I met Michael, mm -hmm. but Michael had invited Kadeem to his house. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, Kadeem convinced Michael to let him have the keys to his Porsche. And Kadeem did not have a driver's license, oh, as I told man. you. But he didn't drive the car. He would just roll it down the driveway and then back it back up. And, and Mike was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Wow. He, he was just backing it up wow. and bringing it and parking it in the driveway. <laughs> and, and he was like, hey, boy, get out he, the car. He, What's he, wrong he with you? manifesting. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, he was you manifesting. Know, it's just some, a some, license. That's what yes. he needed to manifest a license. He was manifesting a license. Man, with D, man, we appreciate you coming through. This has man. been so much fun. This, I haven't seen y'all in a long time. I had a long know? time. And just catching up and talking. Yeah, and, yeah and, this is and, good uh, fun. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to you getting back on stage at some point. Uh, yeah, uh, but it, it'll be with the camera. It's not okay. going to be with the microphone. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair this enough. is the closest to stand up that I'm going to go. <laughs> Fair enough. The DNK Comedy <laughs> Show. Hey, now. <laughs> can you uh, look in this camera? Let everybody know where they can find you on social media and all that stuff. I'm everywhere. Uh, Daryl M. Bell on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and I think that's it. Cause I don't, yeah, I'm not TikToking yet. Yeah, <laughs> I, not, love, I love TikTok. I, yeah, I'm, nothing wrong with TikTok. I, TikTok. I just, yeah, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and my website, DarylMbell.com. There we go, Cornelia. You can find me Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cornelia. Uh, website Cornelia.com, like Kenny and Ophelia. Uh, another, I have my own podcast, Black News. It's available on all apps where podcasts can be heard. We only talk about news involving Black people. So oh. head on over there. Yes, head on over there. <laughs> and you can follow me, Flex A For Real, or For Real, that's F-O-R-E-A-L, on Instagram, uh, on TikTok, uh, Flex Alexander on Facebook. And I can't remember if I'm on anything else. I don't think I'm on anything else. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not on Twitter. Yeah. You're on a natural high. Yeah, I'm on a natural high. There we go. <laughs> that's what and you're on. And please, do us a favor. Right down at the bottom. Subscribe and hit that like button. Smash Subscribe, that like button. Smash it, smash it, as BitBoy would say. Smash. Go ahead and smash that like button. We appreciate you guys. We'll see you again right here at Flex Zone All In Podcast. Now we got our own music. Y'all see it. Y'all know. Y'all love it. Here we go. Oh, the music. I thought you really was going to toss us some music. No, oh. it's our music. <laughs> <laughs>